Okay, uh, Jack Sight, Sight Vite. Uh, what are your thoughts on gender? How does a person know what gender they are? It all just seems so confusing to me, and I wish I could get a straight answer on the matter, which isn't some restatement of, well, what do you feel your gender is? Because that doesn't help at all. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're going to define gender in terms of how a person feels, it certainly isn't going to be helpful to then just say, well, the gender you are is a matter of whatever gender you feel you are. Uh, because because the question then is, OK, but what the hell is it to feel like you are a man or a woman or non-binary, as the case may be? Um, what, like, what is that? What is that feeling? Um, so, yeah, I mean, you'd want a slightly more substantive answer than that. I have to say this isn't really a topic that... Um, that I have strong views on. Uh, I mean, partly because I've read other accounts of what gender is and what gender identity is, and I often come away with the feeling that I, I don't really, I guess I just don't really have a gender identity then. This isn't something that I think about. I mean, obviously I'm aware that most people will classify me as a man, um, and I'm obviously aware of the sort of usual social roles that are expected of a man, and I I don't, I'm fine with that, like I'm fine with people classifying me as a man. Maybe that's all that's really required. <laughs> Maybe that's all that's required to know what my gender is. But I take it that the usual view here is going to be that, well, there's a distinction between how other people might classify you and the expectations they might have of you and uh, your own gender identity. When you ask how does a person know what gender they are, I take it that you're really referring to the the gender identity part of it. Um, like, okay, so yeah, obviously I, you know, it's just a simple empirical question how other people classify me. Um, I can figure out that pretty easily, okay? So I can notice that other people will say that I'm a man. Other people will use he, him pronouns when referring to me. Um, that's a matter of straightforward observation. So no problem there. Um, in, in that sense, I can discover, okay, I am generally classified as a man. Um, now, what is my gender identity? Well, what is what is gender identity? I, I don't uh, I don't really know. I, I did have, make a video with um, somebody uh, called Diana who has a lot of views about this. The video was uh, from the point of view of, um, you know, like it was it was on it's called trans philosophy what is gender um so this is from a specifically trans point of view as it were it, it, that that's that's what it's like focusing on but that video gives an account of gender identity that isn't simply a restatement of well what do you feel your gender is so you know there are options available there um i mean look my take on this is generally that um like if if i had to give a view so there are there are like distinctions that we draw between people and one of these distinctions is a distinction in terms of certain biological properties uh, so we can divide people up on the basis of their chromosomes on the basis of their reproductive organs on the basis of the size of the gametes that they produce on the basis of various secondary sex characteristics um, these are all ways of thinking about biological sex. Now, actually, even when we just look at biological sex, when we look at these you know, biological properties, they don't classify everybody exactly the same way. What you get are slightly cross-cutting classifications. Um, so, you know, there are some people who have uh, XY chromosomes, but who have female reproductive organs. Um, because I think if you have XY chromosomes, but the it's either called the syr or sry i always get them confused there's a gene the sr the syr or sry gene <laughs> i'm not sure which it is um if that gene is not activated then even with the xy chromosomes you will end up developing uh female reproductive organs and you, you and female secondary sex characteristics you will be for all you know everyday purposes just female. I mean, it, it, it pretty plausibly, you're just a biological female. Um, <clears throat> so, okay, even the bio, so even when it comes to the, these biological properties, it's somewhat cross-cutting. But, you know, we can idealise, we can abstract, and we can just talk about biological sex, right? Biological sex, divide people into, you know, the men, the male, and the female. And then we notice that 
these different categories are very closely correlated with um, certain important social roles you know, it has the, the, this distinction, this distinction with respect to biological sex has social consequences, as it were. And so you can look at the way that people act socially. Um, there's certain features that are, you know, so the fact that, for instance, um, biological females are the ones who reproduce. Well, that obviously has significant social consequences. The fact that we um, have these normative expectations so once you once you know there's 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 like a visible difference between males and females and then unsurprisingly that creates sort of normative expectations um there are you know very often we think that there are certain ways that men and women ought to be for instance i mean so we end up with a significant difference on the social level um and then once you've got, but then, you know, you can notice that, again, the these two categories are not perfectly aligned. Um, so, you know, you have some people who are of this biological sex, but they end up occupying a different social category. Um, and then, you know, the question of, well, what what is my gender would have something to do with, like, how I'm relating to those 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 two social categories or maybe not two maybe there's more than two but in any case it's going to have something to do with that like do i accept the norms associated with that um i i, I mean i don't really know i'm kind of just rambling here um and so what i'm saying maybe doesn't <laughs> maybe doesn't make any sense um maybe i should just stop answering this question because I, I don't actually remember what I said and I don't know if it made any any sense I, I'm talking off the top of my head here I don't uh, I, I don't know what I'm talking about um, I've completely lost the thread of my thought on this so I've just said something about this I don't know if it you know I, I, I can't remember what it was and I, it may not have made any sense um, That's annoying. Should I just like restart this? Um, because I did take a break and I just restarted this. No, you know what? I'm going to leave this in here. The thing that's um, yeah, I'm I'm just sort of thinking about um, about this uh, about whether I should leave this in. Um, I'm going to leave this in. The reason why I was thinking about whether or not to leave it in is. Um, you know, you, you've asked me this question of, well, what exactly is gender? How do you know what your gender is? And what I did there was give a kind of rambly and not very good answer to that, where I then openly admitted that it was rambly and not very good. And the thing that's worrying me about this is that, you know, somebody's, there's going to be people who will look at that and be like, ha ha, see, nobody knows what gender is. It's all just a load of bullshit. And um, now that would obviously be a very stupid response. Uh, but people might be inclined to make that response. So what I'm going to do is leave in what I said, but I'm going to also put this caveat in that anybody who makes that response is a fucking idiot. Um, so uh, I, think, I think with that said, I've kind of covered everything that, that needs to be covered. The, the reason why you're a fucking idiot if you make that response is that, of course, there's absolutely no guarantee that something like gender would be easy. Uh, that it would be like, why, why the hell would you think it would be? In fact, even th again, the same is true of biological sex, right? Like if you try to, you know, like actually get into the details of how biological sex works, there's a huge, I mean, there's a great deal of complexity there. Um, so even if you're one of those people who wants to say, well, you know, gender's just, a, it's just a matter of what your sex is. Um, <laughs> you're still not going to be able to give a simple answer or, or rather you can give a simple answer but when you give that simple answer you're just idealizing and if you want to you know if you want to just idealize I mean, you can give a simple answer about the gender thing as well like yes we can draw these simple lines but we're the ones drawing the lines in the face of this enormous variety and complexity uh, and diversity in in you know that we're actually confronted with um so okay there we go. I'm going to move on now. Right. Um, 
Jackie Poon says, in your opinion, what do you believe is the most convincing solution to the Frege Geach problem? I, I hate the Frege Geach problem. I hate the whole literature about it. I think that this is this has been, you know, just decades and decades of people just wasting their time. Um, OK, so with that said, right, that's my actual opinion about it. Sorry. The reason is, is that um, all of this literature is operating with a view of meaning that seems I, I certainly I don't see any reason to accept it in fact I think there are probably good reasons to reject it so the assumption that underlies the Frege Geach problem is is that um you know our statements uh express propositions there's a fact of the matter about the propositions that our statements express and moreover um the 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 proposition that is expressed by a kind of atomic moral statement the, that meaning, that proposition is then going to be preserved when the atomic moral statement is embedded in larger statements. So like I say, for instance, torture is wrong. Well, torture is wrong expresses some proposition. Um, and then the, the, that proposition is preserved when I say if torture is wrong, then such and such. Or Frank wonders whether torture is wrong. Um, or, or, I mean, maybe you wouldn't want to frame this in terms of expressing propositions, because uh, maybe, you know, a non-cognitivist might say, well, it's not really a matter of expressing propositions. Um, but it's like meaning. There's some fact of the matter about the meaning of these terms. And then that meaning is preserved when they're embedded. And I just don't really see any reason to assume that. I mean, I think that... Um, uh, I, I think that meaning is generally, so my general approach to meaning is that it is indeterminate. Um, so meaning and reference are, are indeterminate. I have a video uh, called Referential Pluralism where I outline my defense of a kind of indeterminacy of reference, indeterminacy of meaning view. Of course, there's also, you know, more famous arguments like Quine's, Quine's case for the indeterminacy of meaning. Um, but like once you... Uh, once you adopt that sort of view, I mean, there's just no problem here to solve. And one of the things that's puzzling, I think, about a lot of the literature on the Frege Geach problem is what, like, what is it that we're actually aiming to do? I mean, when you when you look at the when you look at the solutions to the Frege Geach problem that have actually been presented. So let's take for in, I mean, I'm just going to assume that you have some familiarity with them. Take for instance Simon Blackburn's higher order attitudes view, right? Okay, that's. I mean. You know, there are technical objections to it, right? But, you know, broadly speaking, you can see how that works, at least in the case of giving moral arguments. You can kind of see how if you... So on, on this view, you, you have an... You're going to have an attitude to combinations of attitudes. So I can say, um, you know, torture is wrong. That's a matter of having a negative attitude to torture. And then, I, and then if I say, if torture is wrong, then paying somebody to torture is wrong. On the higher order attitudes view, what that means, what I'm doing when I say if torture is wrong, then paying somebody to torture is wrong. I'm expressing a negative attitude to holding the attitude that torture is wrong and holding the attitude that it's okay to pay someone to torture, right? That's, that's basically the idea. Um, and then you can kind of give, uh, you can kind of recover moral, uh, the validity of moral arguments in terms of these like clashes of attitudes. So, okay, interesting idea, but like, are we proposing that as a claim about how, about what's actually going on in people's minds? Because it seems like really psychologically implausible. And even if it wasn't implausible, uh, there's no evidence for it. It's not like Simon Blackburn has gone out and done, you know, studies of what people's attitudes are when they express particular, uh, when they like embed moral statements in larger sentences, right? Like there's just no impression. So if it's a, if it's a claim about um, what's going on in people's minds, then it just doesn't seem like anybody's done the right kind of work to produce the evidence that would be required to support that. And this is a general problem for... Um, all of these solutions to the Frege Geach problem, if they are claims about what's happening in people's minds. Now, if they're not claims about that, if they're not claims about what's happening in people's minds, then, I mean, I'm just not sure what they are. Like, what the hell is even going on there? Um, what What is it a description of? Like, is it is it a kind of, I mean, I guess another way, another thing we, way we could interpret it is we could take it to be a kind of proposal. We could say, well, here's 
a way of interpreting or a way of using moral statements uh, that would allow us to embed those statements, even if that's not how we actually use them, even if that's, that's not how we're actually thinking about them. This is, you know, m maybe this is a proposal for reform. I, I mean, m maybe we could say that, but then if you're giving a proposal for reform, well then, wouldn't it just be simpler to reform our moral language in a way that's just in line with the kind of standard cognitivist view and like so, so that way that way you just easily get you know the validity of moral arguments you easily get to truth conditional theories of meaning and all of that stuff um so you know yeah i i, I don't I, I don't really get even what's going on with a lot of this literature on the frege Gigi. i'm not sure what they're even trying to do um so um Okay, you asked for the for, for the most convincing solution to it. So my general inclination would just be to reject the problem because I reject the uh, the sort of underlying assumptions that are being made about meaning. Um, but I think that if you know, okay, if we're taking this problem seriously, um, probably I think the the most plausible answer would be to go uh, deflationist. Would be, be to go minimalist. If you adopt a deflationary theory of truth then you can immediately account for the truth of atomic moral statements. And, um, you know, you're going to supply deflationary truth conditions. So stealing is wrong if and only if stealing is wrong. Um, and then you can just, you know, you can just say in the usual way, the truth conditions of compound sentences are a function of the truth conditions of the parts, right? Like, so once you, once you have a truth condition for if for stealing is wrong, you can then account for the truth condition for if stealing is wrong, then blah, 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 right? By by just taking the conditional to be truth functional. Um, all that's really required there is the right grammatical form. Uh, so I, I, I would say, you know, if we're approaching this with a more conventional view of how meaning works, I, I like that solution. That, that seems pretty simple and straightforward. And I mean, obviously there are objections to it. I don't find any of the objections particularly convincing. Um, yeah, so... There you go. That's my answer. OK, <clears throat> uh, Jax Rossier, do you enjoy being a doctor of philosophy? I'm considering a PhD. Well, I really enjoyed doing my PhD. I think that that was uh, one of the best times in my life <clears throat> doing the PhD. Um, I'm glad I did it. I would say, uh, you know, you've got to be cautious. You've got to think about whether this is really something you want to do. Most people who do PhDs, they do it because they're aiming to get an academic career, but the academic job market is absolutely terrible. So, you know, that's something to consider. But if you love philosophy and if you manage to get funding for a PhD or you're just independently wealthy, then, yeah, I mean, why not? Uh, <laughs> um, but of course, it will mean it will mean basically devoting yourself to philosophy to the exclusion of everything else, right? If you do a philosophy PhD, then your life becomes philosophy. And it doesn't just become philosophy. It becomes a very, 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 very specific and narrow part of philosophy. So, you know, one of the things I love about philosophy is how you can just jump from, like, you know, I can, I can do ethics, you can do philosophy of logic, do philosophy of mind. But once you do a PhD, suddenly all of that closes down. You've got to specialise. Um, and you're not going to have a lot of time to uh, to study other things you might be interested in. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Um, Jason Push, advice for studying and learning philosophy outside of a university setting. What are some introductions to philosophy, particularly introductions to prominent philosophers like Kant? Well, I think that... Um, I mean, when you so for for advice about studying and learning philosophy outside of university, it's very hard to answer because it's, I mean, it's not clear what your goal is. Um, you'd have to tell me a bit more about what you're aiming to achieve, uh, because like you know, some people might say, well, I just want to kind of, I just want to know a bit more, right? I just want to know a bit more about philosophy, maybe be able to have conversations about it. Um, that's one thing. Another thing, though, somebody might say is. Um, you know, look, I'm, I, I, I work in such and such a field. I think that maybe some of the stuff going on in philosophy, maybe, maybe I work in one of the sciences and I'm thinking that there might be some philosophical issues, maybe some like conceptual issues with s some of the things in this field. And maybe philosophy can help that. That's a very different thing. Another thing would be if somebody is, uh, you know, I don't know, they want to write a book or create a YouTube channel, like what philosophy do I need in order to do that successfully? Um, 
if they're writing a book or creating a YouTube channel about philosophy, uh, you know, what, what will I need? These are all very different things. The advice would be different in each case. But for introductions to philosophy, introductions to prominent philosophers like Kant, well, I mean, I think that... Um, <sighs> So one, one way you could go on this is to just pick up textbooks. Um, I mean, that's actually how I learned most of the philosophy that I learned is it's kind of boring. Uh, it's a boring answer, but actually that is really the best way. Um, so, you know, if you want to learn about Kant, well, you know, if, if it's, say, Kant's ethics that you're interested in, well, pick up a textbook on um, ethical theory. Uh <laughs> Torbjorn Tanzio has a nice one, um, well I've forgotten the title of it, but they usually have titles like, you know, a contemporary introduction to ethics and things like that. Um, or if it's Kant's metaphysics, again, you know, there'll be, you know, the, uh, I don't know, what is it, Rutledge introduction to metaphysics, contemporary introduction to metaphysics, metaphysics and introduction. These are the places that you would want to start with. If you don't like reading textbooks, well, um, Copleston's History of Philosophy is... Um, I think generally considered to be a very uh, fair and very you know balanced and pretty comprehensive um, history of philosophy. <laughs> so uh, maybe you could go there. I don't know. Um, those were some uh, thoughts. You also ask that if if you were forced to join a major world religion, which one would you pick? Um, that's hard. I don't really like any of them. Um, uh, I suppose my initial inclination is to say um, probably some sort of probably some sort of Buddhism or maybe Taoism or something. But the, but I feel like that might be cheating because you know there are ways of like <laughs> I feel like especially at least in the West there are kind of ways of being Buddhist, where it's almost not even a religion, right? Like it's, uh, yeah, I, it, 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 yeah, it's more of like a, a way of life, perhaps, or, um, you know, it's, but if, if I, I mean, the reason why I say that is just because I feel like those religions, or at least some parts of those religions, I, you know, they have an, a kind of attitude, a sort of personality that's more in line with mine. Like when I read about the Taoists, they sometimes come across as being like a bunch of mischievous trolls, um, tr troll, trolls like internet trolls, you know, like they can, they can, they can have that, like that, there's that, they've got a bit of that going on, you know, they, they, they've got a bit of like, you know, Dadaism, there's a bit of like, you know, kind of artiness to them, um, I think, <laughs> again, I don't know much about them, but it, it just feels that way, um, and I think that there's also, you know, like some of the philosophical claims or that there's like maybe a philosophical tradition associated with it that, to be honest, I find much more compelling than the sort of philosophical tradition that seems to be associated with Christianity. Like if you're a Christian, if you, if you go into Christianity and then you, you know, you want to like <laughs> do the philosophy associated with it, then what, are you going to be talking about like Aquinas or something? I mean, that's just rubbish. But like when it comes to Buddhism, the philosophy seems to be more about... Um, well, I don't know, like non-self, right? Or uh, investigations into nothingness. I, yeah, I mean, that's kind of compelling, I guess. Um, but again, I want to be clear, I really don't like any of them at all. And so my answer would be, <laughs> I, I would be very unhappy to be forced to join them. Um, uh, Johan, Johan Heinle can one read your whole bachelor thesis about idealizations as a threat to scientific realism? Well, you could email me and I might be able to send it to you if I can find it. I don't know. I don't really keep archives of my work, so uh, it might have disappeared. But if I've still got it, I'll send it over. But to be honest, I mean, everything I said in that, I think, is, is said in my video on idealizations in the scientific realism series. Uh, oh, well, is it? Yeah, my MA, that's that's based on my, that wasn't my, hang on, that wasn't my bachelor thesis, that was my MA thesis. My MA thesis was the idealization as a threat to scientific realism. My bachelor thesis was, uh, was not about that, but it was about scientific realism. But the bachelor thesis was more um, talking about the, uh, 
the no miracle argument and I kind of try to elaborate a sort of evolutionary argument against it. Um, um, okay. Johnny Boy, do you like anime or manga? If so, which do you read? Uh, no, I, I don't like any of them. I have no interest whatsoever. Okay, Julio Hernandez, a trivialist will agree with everything I say, but that does not mean that I will agree with everything they say. So if I point out a belief a trivialist holds that I disagree with, such as, I have three eyes, I have expressed my disagreement. The trivialist may not recognise my action as an expression of disagreement, but that is irrelevant to the fact that I have in fact expressed it. It seems to me that trivialism is clearly refutable, and the trivialist has just conceptually blinded themselves. Do you think trivialism is irrefutable? Do you think it is impossible to express disagreement? Well, you know, there's sort of two views of what trivialism is. Um, there's like two metaphors for thinking about trivialism. Um, so the, the, I guess the way that people are initially inclined to think of trivialism is that trivialism is like a list, right? It's So they think of a list of propositions and then the trivialist kind of says yes to each of the propositions in that list. So it's just this big list, I guess an infinite list, and the trivialist just goes yes, 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 right? Like all the way down the list. Um, I'm not sure that that's quite right though and so you know what, what, what you're saying is well you know look um sure a trivialist agrees with everything i say they hold that they hold all the beliefs that i hold but um the trivialist holds beliefs in addition to the ones that i hold there are things that i don't believe that the trivialist does believe so that's like trivialism is a list but the thing is is okay we know the trivialist holds this proposition all propositions are true but okay what's a proposition um well given that trivialist thinks that all propositions are true uh pres like presumably the next step here is they're going to endorse uh every account of what a proposition is but of course if they endorse every account of what a proposition is that means that they're going to endorse an account of propositions according to which the only propositions there are are just whatever you believe, right? Like your list of beliefs exhausts all of the propositions. And so they don't actually believe anything else. They just believe exactly what you believe and nothing else, right? On that account of propositions. Of course, they endorse every other account of propositions as well. But, uh, but like, you see what I'm saying? So if you, if you, and like, let's say I just have this really bizarre account of propositions where actually there are only 10 propositions. There's just 10 propositions. That's it. Um, well, then the trivialist holds 10 beliefs, <laughs> at least by their own lights. Um, so, and, and now similarly, we can ask, well, what is it to believe a proposition? So let's say we fix some account of what a proposition is. Well, the next part of trivialism is trivialists to believe all propositions to be true. So what exactly is it to believe that all propositions are true? Well, again, a trivialist will endorse all accounts of what it is to believe something. So the state that you are in when you take yourself to disbelieve that P, for the trivialist, that's a perfectly legitimate expression of a belief state, right? Like there's going to be an account of, of what it is to believe something where the state that you take yourself to be in when you disbelieve P is actually a paradigmatic belief, right? Actually, so the state that you have when you disbelieve P, that state just is believing P, right? That's going to be, there's going to be some account of belief that entails that. And of course, the trivialist will affirm that. So the idea that trivialism involves just this like list of propositions is, you know, it's not so, that's not so obvious, right? Um, another way to think about trivialism is that trivialism is a kind of mirror. Right? And that's how I like to think about it. That like, um, it's, it's, it just sort of has this capacity. It's, it's completely unlimited and it kind of has this capacity to just um, reflect whatever's presented to it. Uh, like whatever you give to the trivialist, the trivialist can can just like do the same thing. Um, so I don't know, that's just another, <laughs> a slightly different way of thinking about it that maybe raises some, some problems for the claim that uh, you can actually distinguish yourself from a trivialist. Um, but okay, put that aside, right? So, so this is this is one point, right? So, so the, the first point is, well, I think if we actually start thinking through what trivialism is committed to, like once you once you make that initial step of claiming all propositions are true, right? Like, what what exactly does it mean to have 
you know, all propositions being true? What does it mean to have that, that kind of maximal content, right? Once you start thinking about that, it's not so clear to me that trivialism involves a list of propositions where you're just affirming all of the propositions. That's point number one. Point number two, let's suppose that we do take trivialism to be a matter of just affirming a list of propositions. Is there any way to distinguish yourself from that kind of trivialist? Well, certainly not to others. I mean, for other people, there's going to be no way of doing that because anything you say. Um, so, like, let's say um, a trivialist says, I have three eyes. And then you say, no, I do not have three eyes. Well, obviously, I do not have three eyes is on the list. Um, now, maybe you don't say that. Maybe you just kind of, the trivialist says, I have three eyes, and then you just shake your head, or you just say, no, I disagree, or no, I don't hold that belief. The problem is, anything you do, right, whether it's shaking your head or saying, no, I disagree, or whatever, um, that might be, you. so you might, you might have the belief that shaking your head means yes right or that saying no i disagree means yes so there's the proposition shaking your head means yes is going to be on the list of propositions that the trivialist affirms so if you are a trivialist then you could easily shake your head or say no i disagree or uh, say no i don't believe that you can do all of that completely it's completely compatible with trivialism as this list of propositions. So certainly for, from the point of view of a third party looking at the way that you're behaving and what you say, there's, there's just nothing, there's no evidence that could distinguish you from a trivialist. Um, so I mean at best what you can do is you could probably say well like I can at least distinguish myself from a trivialist. Um, like I just know by introspection that there are various things I don't believe. The trivialist believes all propositions, but I just, I can look into my own mind and see that I, I don't believe all propositions. A couple of issues with this, I think, though. Um, so, the first thing to notice is that, in general, it's not the case that all of your beliefs are immediately accessible, right? Some beliefs are dispositional. I mean, I believe many things that I'm not currently aware of believing. Um, and... Moreover, I like I know that just introspecting is not going to reveal all of my beliefs to me. You know, if I ask myself, what do I, what do I believe? Well, actually, there's going to be loads of things I believe that are, that are not immediately drawn and, and not immediately made clear by that kind of introspective move. Um, there's just there's just too much. Right. I mean, I, there's thousands and thousands of things that I believe um, and I can't hold all of that in my mind all at once. Now, you might say, well, Okay, fine, but for some specific proposition P, like I can consider a proposition P, I can bring that to my mind, and then I can see that I don't believe it. Okay, so I can reflect on P, I can just see that I don't believe that P. But now the question is, that's fine, but how are you ruling out that additionally you also believe that P? So... Okay, you are in a state of disbelief of P. So maybe maybe you believe that P is false, or maybe you just suspend judgment about P. That's fine, right? Cool. But like, so I introspect. I think about I think about the proposition P. Like, for instance, the sky is green. Okay, so I bring to mind this proposition: the sky is green. And I'm like, yeah, I I believe that's false. It's false that the sky is green. Actually, the sky is blue. So I don't believe the sky is green. Sure, so that's one of the states that I'm currently in. But how am I ruling out that I, I additionally also believe it? Um, the thing is, is that believing that not P or suspending judgment about P is compatible with also believing P. I mean, people can hold contradictory beliefs, right? Maybe you're, you know, maybe you reject dialetheism, you think that there can't really be true contradictions, but clearly it is possible for people to have contradictory beliefs. Um, and so even when it comes to, so even if you're assuming that trivialism is like this list of propositions, and even if you're assuming um, that like all you, all you want to do is satisfy yourself that you are not a trivialist, that you don't affirm every proposition, I'm not 
sure how you can do that. I'm, I'm not sure you can do that. Uh, so, you know, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's where I land, that's where I land on this one. As for this idea of whether trivialism is, you know, refutable, well, I mean, anything that you, anything that you say expresses the content of trivialism, right? The trivialist is just going to agree with, with all of the claims that you make. Um, so I'm not sure where the refutation is there. Um, it's a bit, it's rather strange to say that one can refute a position by just affirming part of the content of the position, right? I mean, yeah, so I find trivialism pretty fascinating. Certainly, I don't think that there's anything, um, you know, I don't think there's anything easy about trivialism. It's not as easy to dismiss as it might initially seem. Um, okay, then, Justice asks, can you explain the dispute around experience being conceptual or not? What exactly does it mean for experience to be conceptual? Uh, there are two related things, experience being propositional and experience and experiential content. Yeah, to be honest, I'm just not really sure what you're referring to there, so I can't explain this. Um, I mean, there's lots of kind of debates in the vicinity of this that like, I know a little bit about. I mean, there's debates about whether there can be uh, entirely non-conceptual experiences. So can there be sort of pure consciousness states, for instance? You sometimes get, get discussions of that in literature on mystical experiences. Um, there's in philosophy of science, obviously, uh, a lot of literature on the theory ladenness of observation. So I guess that would be um, like, you know, like, can there be uh, observations that are that are neutral, that are independent of our theories or, or are all our observations like presupposing some some substantive conceptual background? Um, there's the Celesian dilemma for foundationalism. There's the stuff on the Kantian synthetic a priori. Um, <laughs> like, I mean, this is just, this is too big of a question. I, I, I don't know which one, what you want me to deal with there or what you want me to talk about. Um, so I'm just going to have to move on. I'm sorry. Kenneth Goetz asks, what do you think about Kant's application of categories of understanding to the noumenal do you think this is excessively problematic for Kantian theory? Well, I'm I'm not sure what this is what this is referring to because my understanding of Kant, and I mean I'm not an expert on Kant, so maybe I'm wrong. My understanding of Kant was that he did not think that these categories could be applied to the noumena. Um, uh, my understanding was okay. These sorts of categories of the understanding. So these these categories are like organizing the phenomena. They're, they're, they're the organizing principles of experience, right? In order for experience to be comprehensible and coherent, right? There have to be these, you know, it has to have a certain structure. There have to be these structures or principles in place. But that doesn't tell us anything about, you know, the things in themselves, about the noumena. Um, so we can't even say that, you know, the noumena causes the phenomena because causality is, again, that's something that structures the phenomena. So the noumena is just unknown. Um, now, I mean, whether or not... Now, that particular claim, w whether there's an issue for um, Kant's theory, like, insofar as he tries to, you know, define the noumena, the things in themselves, and then additionally say that we can't know anything about the things in themselves, well, that actually does seem prima facie problematic. <laughs> Um, you know, I mean, because even to say that something is distinct from the phenomena, um, well, that's already making a substantive claim. So there seems to be some tension here, right? And I mean, that's something that people have commented on. But I, I mean, if you're saying, well, what about Kant's application of categories of the understanding to the noumena themselves? I don't think that Kant was trying to do that. But again, I, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on Kant, so maybe I'm wrong. Um, and I, I mean, I don't think that, so with the, with respect to the idea that categories of the understanding just don't apply to things in themselves, or, or maybe I should say the idea that like, all we can really know about is like our own experience, that doesn't seem excessively problematic. I mean, maybe it's problematic for, for whatever Kant's purposes were, but, uh, I think, I think idealism in general is plausible enough theory. So, um... But any, anyway, uh, what are your thoughts on the causal account of knowledge, i.e. that one needs to interact with things to be able to have knowledge of them? I mean, generally speaking, the causal account is usually presented as a sort of externalist account, and I find externalist accounts very unappealing. 
Um, they just seem to me to completely miss the point. Um, so, you know, part of the reason why I, I got into philosophy is because I like to step back and reflect on my beliefs and my assumptions. And I want reasons for my beliefs. You know, I want to, I don't just want to know things in the way that the externalist says that you can know things. I want to know that I know. I want to have I want to be able to produce reasons for what I know. I want to be able to have justification, right? Like this is what I find appealing. On these sorts of externalist accounts, it's going to be the case that, well, um, as long as there's the appropriate causal processes in place, um, then you just count as knowing, regardless of whether or not you can produce any reasons for that, regardless of whether you have any, you know, internal awareness of those of like what those processes are or, or what those reasons are. So like, I know that I have two hands because, you know, there's light bouncing off my hands and going into my eyes. And then there's processes happening in my eyes and my brain. And, and there's, there's this, you know, causal chain, right, from my hands to me forming the belief that I have two hands. And that causal chain you know, has whatever appropriate features the causal chain needs to have. But all of that's happening independently of me. I can know that I have two hands, even if I just never reflect on it at all. And I just never think about what actually justifies my belief. I mean, to me, this is this kind of account of knowledge. You know, it, it might account perfectly well for the sort of animal knowledge, right? Like sometimes we attribute knowledge to animals and to babies and so on. Um, because we want to account for how it is that they're able to get by in the world and achieve their goals and so on. And so, OK, fine, as a sort of idealization of like animal knowledge, maybe these causal accounts and, and in general externalist accounts are perfectly fine. Um, but I mean, it's just not what I'm talking about. It's not what I'm interested in when I'm, I'm, I'm doing philosophy or, or indeed engaging in any kind of inquiry at all. Um, like, like when I'm engaging in some sort of inquiry, the question is, is always going to be, well, what reason is there for me to accept that? Um, and then just, just having there be some, some causal process that maybe we don't even know anything about just, just saying, oh, well, there is this causal process. So, you know, it, it's very unsatisfying. Um, I mean, you know, beyond that, there are like, I suppose, technical issues with it. Um, I think it's it's hard. So I said that maybe these causal accounts are fine when it comes to animal knowledge. Um, I think even um, as far as externalist views go, uh, the like the, at least simple causal accounts seem to struggle to. Uh, they seem to struggle to. Um, account for more theoretical um, knowledge. Like, you know, if I say all humans are mortal, well, um, obviously, the death of a single human being is going is plausibly <laughs> causally connected to my belief that that particular human being is mortal. Um, but in order to get to the claim that all humans are mortal, you need to have an inductive inference, right? There's some ge there's some process of generalization going on. It's not so clear how those sorts of inductive inferences are going to be grounded causally. Like, what's the causal connection between, like, this, you know, my, this process that I'm making of generalizing, how, how is that causally connected to the relevant facts in the world? Mm, it's not so clear. Um, I mean, to be, to be fair, I, I would say that um, you can frame these sorts of causal accounts in in ways that are more in line with internalism so um maybe knowing that p is a matter of being able to reconstruct in your own mind the causal chains uh that led to p or the causal chains from p the fact that p to my belief that p um that would i suppose be a sort of causal view but it would be internalist. Um, it, it, like that would require us to have causal, but causal beliefs, right? Beliefs about the causal chains. Uh, but that just seems that just seems wrong. That actually seems far too strict as an account of like knowledge, because well, you know, people in ancient Greece perceived objects and they knew various things. You know, people in ancient Greece knew that they had two hands. 
but they were completely mistaken, at least some of them presumably were completely mistaken about the nature of the causal chains leading from their hands to their perception of hands. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's the problem. Like, if, if we're thinking of this in an externalist way, then I think it just misses the point as... I, I feel that way about basically all forms of externalism. And if we think of it in an internalist way, then it seems too strict. Um, okay, that's my view on that. Uh, Kits, Kitsugari. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who finds nothing else in the world interesting but gambling and trading? Well, I don't know, man. You'd better uh, better get, get, get gambling. Better buy some cards, buy some coins. You know, start dealing the cards, flipping the coins. I... Um, if that's what you want to do, then go ahead, man. If that's all that, uh, uh, all that you find interesting in your life, then, yeah, knock yourself out. I, I don't really have any problem with that. Um, okay, so, uh, Crusader says, besides the argument from a bad lot, what are some good objections to inference the best explanation? Um, sure, I mean, so one issue is going to be that... Um, the notion of explanation um, and like what counts as an explanation is is actually thoroughly unclear. I mean, that's never really been worked out in any detail. Of course, we have, uh, like if you ask, well, what makes for a good explanation? We can give these theoretical virtues, um, but it's always quite vague and wishy-washy. There's lots of debate about what exactly goes on the list of theoretical virtues and uh, there's going to be plenty of debate about what counts as actually exemplifying those theoretical virtues. And more importantly, um, whatever list we propose of theoretical virtues, it may well be the case, and uh, people who reject IBE will make this case, that these explanatory virtues are not truth-tracking. Um, so when it comes to the bad lot objection, the assumption is that the explanatory virtues are truth-tracking. The assumption is that inference the best explanation will get you to the true explanation if the true explanation is included in the explanations you're considering. The, the, the point the bad lot objection is making is that, well, we have no reason to think that of the explanations we have considered, that the true explanation is in there. Um, but of course, what you can do is say, well, actually, there's just no reason to think that inference to the best explanation is even truth tracking. So there's no reason to think like, even if we did have the true explanation in our set of explanations, um, the inference, the best explanation would lead us to select the true explanation. So, I mean, take for instance, simplicity. Well, um, simplicity, we often, you know, say like, this is a theoretical virtue, right? Occam's razor, um, you know, do not multiply entities beyond necessity or whatever. That's one way of thinking about simplicity. But there's a whole other load of ways of thinking about simplicity. I mean, there's there's like 10 different ways of defining what counts as simplicity. And it's it's really quite unclear how simplicity is supposed to be connected to the truth. I mean, we can give toy examples of this, right? So um, if I take some theory T and then I take... So imagine some theory T and then take T plus some other completely unrelated claim. T plus the claim that God exists, right? So call that T plus. Well, T plus is presumably less simple than T, um, you know, in, just in the sense that it's like affirming more, it's, it's you know, committing itself to, to more. Like whatever T is committed to, T plus is committed to all of that plus the existence of God. Um, so, okay, it seems to be less simple, but it's also less probable, precisely because it says more. Um, so, okay, it's, it's less simple, but it's less probable. Um, the issue with these sorts of toy examples is that it just doesn't, it, it's very hard to like translate that to um, actual situations of theory choice. I mean, one problem is, is that when we are, uh, you know, when, when, we're, when we're making explanations, we often want those explanations to be pretty detailed and precise. So we actually want them to say quite a lot, right? Like a good explanation is going to be kind of a priori quite improbable. <laughs> uh, precisely, you know, like a good explanation needs to rule out a lot and it needs to be very precise and specific and so on. It needs to specify exact causal relations and things like that, right? So um, it, like 
in in the process of like constructing something that we take to be a good explanation you are already making it less and less simple in that sense or, or like you're making it less and less probable at least um and, and anyway what we're actually confronted with it's not like we ever have to confront well we have on the on, on the one hand t and then t plus something else what we're really confronted with is just competing webs of belief um with all, you know, they may have all sorts of like different auxiliary assumptions and there's different kinds of even different, you know, like background values, like different people are going to be willing to take different sorts of risks with their beliefs and so on. And I mean, it's not just a simple choice between like theory and then theory plus something else. Um, moreover, it's not the case that you like have a theory and then you immediately see what that theory can account for. Uh, it took over a hundred years to develop uh, compelling Newtonian models of the orbits of the planets. Like, you know, Newtonian mechanics had a lot of trouble accounting for the stability of the solar system. And when Newtonian mechanics was originally, like, so on, on Newton's view, originally, he ended up having to invoke God in order to, uh, you know, it's like, well, God intervenes occasionally um, and fixes things in order to keep the solar system stable, right? Um, it took quite a long time before Newtonian models that accounted for the orbits of the planets were developed. Um, so, you know, like the, the, the real situation that we face with when we're asked to cho choose between theories are these competing webs of belief where it, it really is just unclear what is really entailed by them, uh, what sorts of phenomena they're going to be able to account for. Um, you know, like one option, you know, one theory will be simple in some ways, the other will be simple in, in, in different ways. Like, you know, you, so you might have a theory that like, um, I, I don't know, imagine different theories of the, uh, planetary orbits. Like maybe, for instance, um, the the Copernican theory uh, has fewer epicycles than the Ptolemaic theory, but maybe it requires, I mean, I'm, this is just like off the top of my head, uh, maybe it requires like some orbits to be circular and some orbits to be elliptical. Okay, like imagine if you're faced with that, you're like, well, okay, so we have one theory which has these epicycles that seems less simple but then we have this other theory that has like some circular orbits and some uh more elliptical orbits so there's like a distinction in the different kinds of orbits like isn't that also less simple i mean these are the sorts of problems that you actually face and um so with that said uh this is going to be one of the concerns about ide right like that it's just not clear whether these sorts of um theoretical virtues are actually truth tracking. Um, okay, well, uh, that's the answer to that. All right, uh, Lay Sultanic says, how old are you? I'm 32. What is the future of engineering? Um, I have uh, I have no idea. I mean, well, I mean, you know, there's, there's two, there's two ways I can see us going in the future, right? I'm, I'm quite pessimistic. Um, I, I think like one option is, is civilization just collapses or declines um in which case you know en engineering would simplify um so if climate change and resource depletion and all of these problems if if we don't um solve all of these problems then you know we're probably going to see a decline of civilization even if we do solve those problems actually um there's the issue of I mean, maintaining the population, right? Like as you get a simpler population, that's going to, sorry, as you get a smaller and smaller population, you're probably going to get less economic productivity. And so, uh, you know, the, the point is, is that this kind of like, um, you know, this kind of m m highly sophisticated industrial, like mega machine uh, that, we, that, that civilization today is, um, it's not at all clear that that's going to continue. Um, it may well be the case that the future is just some sort of horrible dystopia where, uh, you know, everything, everything is, uh, micromanaged. All of our behaviors are rigidly controlled. Um, you know, mass surveillance state, right? AI, it's like run by AI that's just far more intelligent than any of us that can predict our behavior perfectly, that knows exactly how to manipulate us. Um, I mean, these are some things that could happen in the future. Uh, <laughs> I, I have no idea. Um, how to learn the most from a first time read? 
depends on what you're trying to achieve really but i think that uh the way that i would approach this if you really want to learn something is first of all well first of all you want to read the relevant background material so when it comes to philosophy i don't think you're going to get much by just picking up the primary source without like if if you for instance were to just go and you're like okay i want to learn philosophy so i'm just going to go and pick up bertrand russell's on denoting um because for some reason you want to start with analytic philosophy the thing is, is I think if you go to on denoting blind, it just won't make any sense. And you'll probably get very, you will probably end up um, forming lots of incorrect beliefs uh, about what Russell was doing, because, you know, like words will be used in different ways to how they're normally used. It, it would be very easy to misunderstand him. Um, so what you should do before you go and read the primary source is to read introductory material that explains the context and explains what this is doing and it, it, you know it explains the arguments once you have that in your mind okay you can go and read it and get something out of it and then as you're reading it you know take notes one of the things that i find is the best way to learn something is to try to teach it i mean that's why i do the youtube channel um i i like to make videos and teach what I learn to other people because that helps me learn the material that I'm, you know, currently reading about. Um, you also ask, uh, what's a fact? Well, I mean, I tend to think of facts as being either states of affairs in the world or as just being like true propositions i mean depending on the context you know like so a fact can either just be like something that's happening <laughs> or it can be a true description um that's the way i would think about them um okay lamoa lamau i don't know uh, do you have any affinity to either a position that regards difference as subordinate to identity or a position that regards identity as subordinate to difference i don't know what that means so no i don't have any affinity to that manav Katar Kar. Has Michael Humer solved most of the epistemological problems? Well, I pretty strongly disagree with Humer on a whole bunch of things. So obviously I would be inclined to say no. Um, I, I mean, I guess it depends on what you want to count as a solution, because I think Humer has been pretty successful at, um, at the kind of public engagement work, actually. Like, lots of people... Uh, outside of academia and even within academia but also lots of people outside of academia who talk about philosophy seem to be aware of Michael Humer and they seem to like Michael Humer's strategies you know they, they seem to like phenomenal conservatism like it's very common um when it comes like if I'm debating meta-ethics I will very often come across people who take the phenomenal conservative line they'll they'll take the line that you know seemings provide defeasible justification and uh, you know, I have all of these seemings about, like, I have moral seemings and, you know, there's no convincing argument against them. Like, they'll have that kind of view. Um, so, I mean, Michael Humer has been pretty successful, I think. He's been more successful than most philosophers are. But I don't think that would count as a solution to the problems. There are plenty of pretty serious difficulties uh, with Michael Humer's views. I think Michael Humer himself would admit that. I mean, any philosopher is going to admit that. Uh, that, that uh, yeah, I mean, of course, this position is, it's not, it's not like we have a knockdown argument for it. There is plenty of reasonable disagreement about it. And as long as there is reasonable disagreement about it, um, I suppose we can't claim to have solved things. But, m you know, my view is, uh, well, I, I, I don't really agree with Michael Humer on anything. So <laughs> I don't think he's solved most of the epistemological problems, no. Um, Martin Bennett, what hardware and software do you need for getting started with a YouTube channel? What recommendations do you have based on your experience? Um, well, the stuff that I use is very simple, uh, as is probably obvious. I mean, I just have a webcam that I do for these sorts of videos, and then um, for the lecture-style videos, well, again, I just use this webcam to record the audio, and then uh, I have a screen recorder. Um, uh, what the hell is it called? I, uh, what on earth is it called? Oh, Streamlabs OBS. That's it. Streamlabs OBS is what I use, and then obviously just a PowerPoint. Um, that'll that'll do the job. Uh, I think if you wanna 
if the YouTube channel that you are, you have in mind is one that's about philosophy, now obviously lots of YouTube channels are trying to do different things and I can't comment on what would be required for that. Um, as for recommendations, it's really tough because you've got to bear in mind that for the first like seven or eight years of my channel, I didn't really put any effort whatsoever into actually growing it. I mean, I was just doing it really p purely for fun, um, <laughs> purely for my own benefit. Um, I, and so I, like, I, I didn't really think very much about like, okay, what do I need to do in order to get views? Like, how do I appeal to an audience? Um, I mean, even these days, al although I do care, I like, I care about the channel now. Um, but even now, I'm not really very good at marketing it. And I, I can, I mean, basically, I continue to just do what I enjoy. Um, and that's it. I, I just do what I find, you know, compelling at the time. And I don't really think about it. And I'm lucky that because I've just, I think the thing is, is that because I've just been grinding away at this channel for so long, it has just built up an audience. But, but it's, it's just a matter of like brute time you know it's it really is just like I've just been doing this for so long that the audience is like gradually built up but I really have no idea how to um how to appeal to a larger audience and get more people interested so I I don't have a lot of recommendations really no um does causal determinism imply a form of moral realism brackets I think it does well, I'd be curious to know why you think it does. I mean, my initial reaction to this is I would have thought that causal determinism would raise some problems for moral realism. And the reason is um, there's a, you know, a lot of people seem to assume a kind of ought implies can principle that um, like if you ought to do something, that implies that you can actually do it. Like it wouldn't make sense to say that you know, I, I ought to uh, square the circle uh, because it's just not possible. And similarly, like, it, it wouldn't make sense to say that, like, I, I ought to, like, I have a moral obligation to end world poverty because that's just completely outside of my abilities, right? Like, um, no, what, what, I, what I ought to do is going to be constrained by what I can do. Now, if we accept causal determinism, then you might be a compatibilist about free will, in which case you'll be perfectly happy to say that we can do different things to what we actually did, but you might not be, right? You might you might be an incompatibilist. So if you're a causal determinist and you endorse incompatibilism about free will, then I can't do anything other than what I actually did. Um, so the most that you could say would be, again, if you, if you endorse or implies can, then that's going to be, well... <laughs> like this would be a kind of moral realism where like the only moral obligations are just to do whatever it is you actually did, which I think would be very strange. I mean, um, so, OK, there's a lot of assumptions there, but they're fairly, you know, common assumptions. Right. So, OK, if we have causal determinism and then we're incompatibilists about free will and we endorse the ought implies can principle, it does seem like there is prima facie uh, a problem. There's something very puzzling um, about, I mean, that just seems to be like outright incompatible with, with moral realism, actually. Um, it, you know, there wouldn't be a, any, certainly like there wouldn't be any room for a, a kind of objective concept of moral responsibility. Um, and the most, I, I guess it might still be compatible with, um, with making value claims. So, I could still say that, you know, certain states of affairs are morally better than other states of affairs. But I wouldn't be able to talk about people having obligations anymore. Like, I wouldn't be able to say that, oh, well, yeah, this person who owns slaves, they ought not to have done that. You ought not to have enslaved anyone. No, because they, they actually didn't have a choice. Uh, they, they, that, that is all they could have done. Um, so anyway, that was just my initial reaction to that. But, you know, like I say, I'm curious why you think that Causal determinism implies moral realism. Um, Maya Lee asks, do you think reincarnation could be possible? Well, possibility is is very easy. Possibility is very weak, I think. I think re reincarnation, yeah, could, could be possible. Um, but so could pretty much everything else. Um, it's possible that... It's, it's possible that the entire world is 
composed of like tiny leprechauns, right? Like maybe, maybe it's not really composed of atoms. Maybe it's actually composed of tiny leprechauns all running around. And uh, all of the objects around us are just emergent properties from the activities of these tiny leprechauns. That's possible. Um, so, I mean, possibility is is not that interesting in itself, I think. Um, and I mean, I, what I'm saying here, I don't think is, is really too controversial, right? Like, I think the standard view would be that um, in the broadest sense of the term possible, something is going to be possible just in case it's it doesn't entail a logical contradiction, for instance. Um, well, reincarnation doesn't seem to entail a logical contradiction, so, okay, it counts as possible. Um, I'm not sure that I would endorse that view of possibility, but just, you know, that's one, you know, like, broad, the, uh, the broadest kind of possibility is going to be logical possibility, and, yeah, reincarnation is logically possible. Um, now, if you're asking, do I think reincarnation is... You know, like, okay, it, it, am I at all inclined to take it as a sort of live hypothesis? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess that the best case for something like reincarnation would be if we endorse the idea of something like a multiverse um, or we endorse... Uh, a kind of um, cyclical view of the universe uh, where you have the Big Bang and then it starts collapsing into the Big Crunch and then that has the Big Bang again. So, but basically, if you th if you endorse a kind of view of the universe or the multiverse where things last forever, then there might be a kind of reincarnation because if things last forever, then you should expect that at some point um, there's going to be a copy of of you there's going like like this is going to happen again um if things last forever um uh, so that would be a kind of reincarnation um and i i guess that's within the, the you know the realm of uh, like plausibility um i mean yeah maybe there is a multiverse and maybe it is just eternal and maybe all of this is just going to happen again maybe and maybe that's a satisfying kind of reincarnation. But that's the sense in which I would take reincarnation seriously. Now, as for the idea that, you know, there could be, like, some soul within my body, and then, like, when my body dies, my soul goes to something else, and it's uh, somehow put into some other organism. Well, I, I just don't see any reason. I, I don't even think about that. You know, that's just not... It's not a live hypothesis. Okay. Um, Mikkel Pelleas... What do you think about written fiction, novels, poetry, theatre, etc., and its connection to philosophy? The fact that some people study, for example, Dostoevsky as a philosopher. Uh, I don't read fiction because I don't have time. Um, I spend so much of my time reading non-fiction, reading philosophy mostly. I really don't have time to read fiction. And I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to do that in my free time because, again, I, I'm reading so much where the reading is like work that, when I'm not working, I don't want to have to do that. So I'm not, you know, again, like I don't really engage with written fiction and therefore I don't have many thoughts on its connection to philosophy. I would say that in general, though, I'm not, I don't really like uh, using, so what we can do, right, is like bring, is raise philosophical questions about fiction. There are lots of interesting philosophical questions about fiction. So one of the, one of the interesting philosophical questions would be, um, you know, like, why is it that people engage with painful art, right? Why is it that when people read fictions, um, they seem to seek out uh, stories that will provoke negative emotions? That's a kind of philosophical question. It's paradox of tragedy, right? And, you know, there's lots of interesting things to say about that. So that's one type of connection. But then it's what you're describing there when you ask, like, OK, there's people that study Dostoevsky as a philosopher. Um, what's going on there is that we're using the fiction as a vehicle for making philosophical points. And to be honest, I find that basically unimpressive. I, 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 I don't think it... I just don't think fiction is a very good medium for doing philosophy, um, to be honest. Uh, 
I mean, again, maybe I just haven't read the right things because I don't really read fiction. But I have watched movies. I mean, sometimes you get movies that uh, try to do philosophy. And it can be cool when... I mean, look, there are movies which will just sort of have these philosophical themes where they, like, prompt you to think about things. I don't know, maybe you watch something like Blade Runner and it prompts you to think about some question, you know, about, like, well, you know, what does it mean to be human? And uh, what does, uh, like, how do we distinguish, like, you know, could, could a, an artificial life form be a person, right? Maybe you start thinking things like that. But ultimately, what you're not going to get in Blade Runner is any kind of, you know, like rigorous, careful argument. And that's what I value in, you know, doing philosophy. I, I value sort of specifying the different theories available and then looking at the arguments for those theories. Um, fiction is just not a good medium for expressing that, I think. Um, Minkle Kai asks any deeper meaning behind the profile image. So I take it you're talking about the Plague Doctor. Well, uh, this w has been my profile image for many, many years. Um, I'm, back when I first started the YouTube channel, I put on the Plague Doctor image, and the reason is simply that I I think Plague Doctors are cool. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I've always, I mean, I'm not like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on history or anything, but I do have, an interest in some periods of history and uh, the period, per like plagues have always been kind of fascinating to me. Um, I don't know why, but like those periods of history where you get um, plagues and, and diseases in general um, and, and the sort of impact of diseases on human societies uh, is really interesting. And so that was it. I mean, I just it was just something that looked cool and it was related to a period of history that I found interesting. Um, so I selected it for that reason. Um, interestingly, of course, it became very, uh, like, it, it, it took on a new kind of relevance when COVID happened, which, which kind of annoyed me, actually, because I realised that having the image of a plague doctor while there's this global pandemic that's resulted in, you know, massive lockdowns all over the world. Um, people are going to think that I chose that image because of the COVID. And I didn't. I didn't choose it for that reason. I mean, people are going to think that this is just some, you know, I'm just jumping on the bandwagon. I'm jumping on the COVID bandwagon. Um, whereas, no, I wasn't jumping on a bandwagon. That's always been my profile image. And it, and it used to be this kind of just more personal idiosyncratic thing but now whenever anybody looks at it it's going to be associated with this like global event that like everybody got affected by and that annoys me um but the problem is is that because that was my profile image it's been my image for so long that's the image that's now associated with me so i didn't really want to change it um mokmar asks is there truly anything you can help me with uh, probably not. Uh, Mai asks, can we trust our own rationality? If not, then it appears we cannot know anything. However, that seems to require a rational argument as well, and so we cannot know that, and so on. Hence, a paradox. How can we solve this? Um, so, I think, uh, okay, first point is, I think there can be uh, rational arguments in favour of rationality. Um, and notice, of course, that rationality may not be self-supporting um so uh, if i if i so the question can we trust our own rationality well in response to that i could give a rational argument and you, you know prior to uh, engaging in the investigation it might be the case that i can come up with you know reasons that favor trusting rationality or maybe i just won't be able to come up with reasons that favor trusting rationality in which case rationality would be uh, would be self undermining um but okay suppose that rationality like suppose that we sort of engage in this investigation and we're unable to come up with reasons to trust rationality so it's almost like rationality entails that rationality is untrustworthy well then it looks like okay well we shouldn't trust rationality because <laughs> obviously if if we shouldn't trust rationality then we shouldn't trust it if we should trust rationality, well, 
then the problem is, is that we have this rational argument to the effect that we shouldn't trust rationality. So if we should trust rationality, then we also shouldn't trust rationality. Um, now, of course, that argument is, is itself going to be self-defeating, given that it's a rational argument. But of course, that's exactly what you would expect. If, if, if rationality is untrustworthy, then of course, an argument to the effect that rationality is untrustworthy is going to be self-defeating. Of course it is. Um, so, I mean, okay, look, it, th there is a, a kind of paradox here, right? So um, if we suppose that we can't trust rationality, then, I, I mean, it, there's this weird situation where, like, we're not going to be able to give a rational argument for that, like a compelling rational argument for that. Um, and so maybe it seems like we can't know that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm actually not sure if there is a problem here. So like, okay, wait a minute. If can we? If it, if not, then it appears we cannot know anything. Yeah. However, that would. Rec oh yeah. Okay. So we we are saying that um, from the claim that we can't trust our rationality, we're concluding that we can't know anything. But in order to get to the claim that we can't know anything, that would require a rational argument. Yeah, but but why? I mean, like, once we're not trusting rationality, w why would we uh, make this assumption that the move from not being able to trust rationality to not knowing anything is legitimate? I mean, like, it just all disappears at that point, right? Like, if you can't, like, all of these inferences that you're making, um, <laughs> you can't trust any of them. So uh, you're asking for a solution here. But I mean, what kind of solution... What kind of solution? A solution given in reasons? If I give you a solution that appeals to reasons, then it's obviously not going to be a solution that you find compelling because you're not going to trust the appeal to reasons. Um, so what do you do if you can't reason? I don't know, maybe just uh, like go outside or sit and listen to music or something. <laughs> maybe that's the solution. Um, I mean, I suppose the... Uh, uh, like, whether or not this is paradoxical is going to rest on whether or not there are convincing rational arguments that undermine rationality. Because it might be the case that when we investigate whether or not we can trust rationality, we just come to the conclusion that, oh yeah, actually we can trust rationality, and then there's no problem. Um, I mean, there might be concerns about whether that sort of argument in favour of rationality is circular. Um, that might be a problem, but that's certainly not the problem that you're describing. Um, so yeah, I think that... I, I actually don't think what you're describing here is a paradox. I think that the, the, the issue here is just, if you're not trusting rationality, then you're not going to be trusting any inference that you make. So, yeah, you're not going to be able to trust the inference from um, rationality is untrustworthy to we can't know anything. Um, but it's, you're also not going to be able to trust the inference that you're making to, the, to, to this claim that it requires a rational argument to show such and such. And you just can't trust anything. Um, New Hendrix, other than Galileo, who is another historical scientist who went against method and how did they do so? Well, I mean, that's kind of a difficult question to answer because it depends on what you think the scientific method is. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't know, right? Like, the way that this usually works is that somebody will propose an account of what they take the scientific method to be. And then, you know, we look historically and we say, oh, look, well, there's these cases of people who... Uh, who violated that method but where it was to the benefit of science um but of, but i mean it's not like i mean the whole point here is that there isn't some scientific method there isn't some universal scientific method so it's not like oh there is this universal scientific method but then we can find scientists who went against the method and got results the the, the, the argument that's being made is um there is no such method so like against method when against method when Firebend uses that in the title of his book, um, what he means there is not like, okay, here are some scientists who are going against method. What he's saying is there is no scientific method, um, or at least there are no, you know, universal methodological rules, right? Like that's, that's the idea. Um, now, I mean, as for other historical scientists who, I mean, look, again, it depends on what the method is, but um, okay, well, another example used by Farabend was um, Einstein's attitude to some of the evidence that seemed to disconfirm his theory. So um, shortly after general relativity was proposed, um, Dayton Miller performed a bunch of experiments on ether drift, which 
seemed that he he basically um, tried to uh, run the Mickelson Morley experiments again, but he did it under much more uh, careful and like precise conditions. So he did it under much better conditions than the original Mickelson Morley experiments, and he seemed to get positive results for ether drift. Um, now, the attitude that Einstein had at the time was just to kind of just to dismiss these results and to say, I mean, basically just to say these, this theory is just so beautiful and it, you know, it, it's so explanatory, pow explanatorily powerful and mathematically elegant that we should believe this even in the face of these, you know, seemingly disconfirming results. Now, I mean, much later, like in the 1950s, I think, uh, a scientist called Robert Shankland went back and reanalyzed Dayton Miller's data and found that it doesn't contradict general relativity. So turns out there was no problem. But um, the point is, is, you know, we might have a kind of naive view of the scientific method where we're saying, well, what happens in science is scientists propose theories, they perform experiments, you know, so they propose theories, they derive predictions, perform experiments to test those predictions. And if the experiment disconfirms the prediction, then you go back and modify the theory. Well, Actually, no, right? What very often, I mean, the, the pro part of the problem is, is that I think any scientist is probably gonna know that experiments are always very much open to interpretation. It's, it's very rare that you actually get like a, just a clear result one way or the other. But what, what happens is not so much that, okay, we have this disconfirming result, so we go back and modify the theory. Sometimes you have a disconfirming result and you say, Nah, there's probably just something wrong with the experiment. We're just going to assume that <laughs> something went wrong with the experiment. I'm just going to dismiss that and maintain my theory. Um, that happens very often, actually. And, um, you know, the Einstein case is one case of that. Um, so there you go. That's just that, that's another example. Right. Um, but as I said, it's not the point here is not that Einstein was like going against the scientific method. The point is more that framing the history of science in terms of uh, these universal method methodological rules is a mistake. Um, <clears throat> okay, so N Noah asks, does the question of other minds bug you? As in, are there other minds? If there are, how do they work slash emerge? I don't really worry about there not being other minds, but it bugs me as I can't figure out how other minds or even my own mind fits in with everything. I can't fit it into materialism and dualism makes no sense to me. Um, uh, okay, well, first of all, if you can't if you can't fit it into materialism and dualism makes no sense to you, well, I mean, the obvious answer would be to just go with some other theory. I mean, you could become an idealist, you could become a panpsychist, a neutral monist, right? There are alternatives to materialism and dualism. Um, so you say. Uh, Self-reflection being an illusion makes sense, but then who is it an illusion for? Does thinking of other minds as smaller components of a shared whole bundle of parts help? Maybe the, the emergence question still stands. How do we move forward? I, I okay. I um, yeah. I, I I mean I like I, I don't I don't really I, I don't really care about this question. <laughs> Like I don't, I'm not bothered by this. I'm not bothered by the question of whether there are other minds or like how my mind fits in with things. Um, like, um, yeah, I just uh, okay. So does the question of minds bug me? No, it doesn't bug me. I really don't care. Philosophy of mind is not and never really has. Like there was a period where I was kind of interested in philosophy of mind, but then I just got interested in other things, and I don't think it's ever really been like I've never felt that like need to uh, account for this um, I, I think that I mean part of it is um, just that I think it's true that we probably can't come up with a kind of materialist scientific model that um, gives us a fully satisfying explanation of the mind right like in that sense I think there probably is a kind of hard problem of the mind um, but as I have argued in an earlier video called The Hard Problem of Everything, I think in the same way, there's a hard problem of absolutely everything else. Um, that there are just going to be limits to what we can achieve. Like, there are limits to the sorts of explanations that are going to be provided by uh, empirical models. Um, so, 
I mean, first of all, there are some aspects of the mind that you can very easily account for empirically. I mean, there's, you know, psychology is a field, right? Like psychology, neuroscience is another scientific field. And they have actually very detailed, sophisticated, empirically supported models of, you know, how the brain works, how the mind works, the correlations between the brain and the mind and so on. Um, you know, so, OK, there's plenty that we can deal with. Um, there are going to be, I, th I think the way I would put it is that there's like ways of thinking about the mind, which seem to make it like divorced or, or like outside the scope of scientific explanation. But I think there's ways of thinking about everything that makes those things outside the scope of scientific explanation. Um, so one way of thinking, so, so one, one option is when we start asking like metaphysical questions about um you, you know like the 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 fundamental like w like okay so what you get with empirical models is uh you know they they can tell you like correlations between phenomena and then you know they can distinguish kind of causation from correlation in a kind of colloquial sense but what you're not going to get from empirical models is um an answer to certain metaphysical questions about causality or constitution. So, you know, if I sort of take, uh, let's say I take an, an interaction between, you know, an electron and another electron, like this electron moves this way, it makes the other electron move that way. Well, I can ask a question about like, what, like, why is it that like this electron has the power to make that electron do that? And that sort of why question I don't think is really dealt with by scientific models. In the same way, um, I would suggest, it, you know, it's possible to say, okay, um, let's take water, right? Water has certain macroscopic properties and it also has certain underlying molecular properties. We can give a scientific explanation of the of macro properties. We can give a scientific explanation of like liquidity by just detailing the underlying molecular properties. But I think it's, totally legitimate to just ask a kind of metaphysical question where you're saying well like why shouldn't you have those underlying uh molecular properties but then it just doesn't manifest as liquidity um in the same way that's kind of the the hard problem of consciousness right like why shouldn't you have these brain states but then it just doesn't manifest as consciousness um to me those seem equivalent so um yeah that kind of metaphysical puzzlement is not really going to be addressed by scientific explanation. Um, and there are other, you know, limits to scientific explanations as well. But this is sort of why I'm, I, I, I'm not troubled by this idea of, uh, you know, I, I don't know, how does the mind fit into the world? I think that, you know, insofar as we're sort of treating minds as being analogous to the other sorts of objects that we subject scientific explanation that, that we take to be subjects of scientific explanation. Well, I, there's no problem um, coming up with empirical models of how the mind works. Uh, if we start asking these like deeper metaphysical questions about, you know, well, how exactly does the causal link work? How does this constitution relation work? Then yeah, science isn't going to address that, but it doesn't address that for anything. So, um, that's basically my view. Um, okay, uh, not yet. Does reading fiction make you smarter or is it like watching movies and playing video games? What's wrong with watching movies and playing video games? Why shouldn't that make you smarter? You can engage with movies and video games in intelligent ways, right? Like you can, you can, yeah. I mean, you can think about movies and video games and uh, you can critically analyze them just as much as you do with fiction. And similarly with fiction, right, you can critically analyze it or you can just, uh, you know, read entertaining trash, right? I, I don't see any relevant difference here. <laughs> um, Nict Zero, are you aware of any of the following? Mark Fisher, Vivek Chibber, Richard Wolfe, opinions on them. So I've never heard of Vivek Chibber. Richard Wolfe, I... Um, do I know Richard Wolfe? Richard Wolfe. I want to say Richard Wolfe. Um, I might be getting the wrong person here, but I feel like he has defended a kind of philosophical anarchism from a Kantian point of view. Um, I don't like Kantianism, so 
I probably wouldn't agree with much of what he says, even though I probably have a lot of sympathy for his conclusions. Was that Richard Wolf? I feel like that was Richard. I could be mixing that up with somebody else. Mark Fisher. Um, I know of Mark Fisher in from two things, right? So the first thing is that somebody had once told me that Mark Fisher had made a point about m a lot of modern art. Where, sorry, not... I don't mean modern art in the way that that's usually used. I mean, like, modern media, okay? M modern television, modern music, modern books. He made this point um, that there's a kind of... There's a sense in which there is this loss of authenticity. There's a kind of ironic distance that you get in a great deal of modern media now where everything, everything is, like, performed with a kind of wink. You know, like, you know, we, we kind of know that this isn't... Like, so... Um, that I, so um you know you I, I can't explain this shit why am i even trying i don't i don't know mark fisher i i but but this point about like the the kind of ironic distance the detachment the fact that um like a great deal of media is not uh it, it doesn't have this in some sense authenticity i suppose it's like everything's kind of meta now um that resonated with me because I totally get it, and I hate it. I hate a lot of it. Um, it really annoys me. Um, so that's uh, that's one thing I know about Mark Fisher. The other thing I know about Mark Fisher is somebody had said that I have very similar mannerisms to Mark Fisher, and that they were therefore worried about me because Mark Fisher committed suicide, and the fact that I was being... <laughs> like doing the things that Mark Fisher does in terms of my behavior apparently I don't know I've never seen Mark Fisher so I have no idea but that caused them to be worried for my safety um so those are the two things I know about Mark Fisher all right opinion on the UK Labour Party uh, I don't I, like who gives up like who cares what, <laughs> I mean uh, the UK Labour Party is the most generic milk toast dull boring I, like centrist neoliberal like who gives a shit I mean I can't I, I, I it is incomprehensible to me how anybody could look at someone like Keir Starmer and find him uh certainly I can't see how anyone could find him uh inspiring um I, I don't even know how anyone could find it like interesting i i mean you know i i i look at someone like keir starmer and uh, my eyes just droop and i want to fall asleep um you know I, I, whereas okay you know I, I like compare that to somebody like tony blair for instance um like i i get the appeal of tony blair like when i watch tony blair or the speeches that tony blair gave in the past i'm not sure what he's like now um but like, I kind of get it. I'm, I'm like, yeah, I can see how this, you know, he was kind of giving a sort of performance that would have been appealing to people. Um, there just doesn't seem to be anything about the Labour Party that's uh, that's appealing. They don't, I mean, I don't really, they don't seem to have any particularly appealing policies. The the, the people uh, involved are not appealing. I, I feel like they're almost certainly going to win the next election, but that's, I, I mean, you know, it's one of those cases where I don't think that the Labour Party... It's not so much that the Labour Party are going to win the next election as it is that the Conservatives are going to lose it. And there is a distinction there. Um, like, I think the Conservatives have lost the next election. And so Labour are going to end up in office. But they're not going to end up in office through winning anything, really. Um, it's kind of a shame that uh, we didn't have, like, Corbyn in now, right? Because, because it would have been interesting to see how that would have worked. Um, like... I feel I feel like given the fact that the Tories have completely imploded, like now's the time to do something wild and uh, radical. Um, like now is the opportunity. Um, not that I really give a shit. I mean, I don't I don't follow this very closely. I th I think that having Labour in power would probably make my life a bit better. So I do usually vote. Uh, I do usually vote against the Tories at least. Um, I would prefer a Labour government, but that really is entirely self, it's just a matter of self-interest. Um, it seems to me that it probably makes things easier for me having Labour in. Um, what's your take on reform or revolution in a Marxist sense? Um, I don't know. Uh, 
do I do I even do I have a take on this? Um, okay, let me let me just go through the other questions because I think I can answer these all at once. Are you involved in local politics? What policies would you like to see implemented? Would you consider yourself class conscious? So, reform or revolution? Local politics? What policies would I like to see implemented? I couldn't. I don't. I don't care. I don't follow it at all. I, I, I actually don't care, right? I mean, I, I kind of wish I did care, but I can't claim to care. Here's the thing, right? I, I do have political views. And I suppose in some sense, I probably would consider myself class conscious. I certainly think that that, you know, that thinking of things in terms of class interests is very, very useful, right? Like, the interests of, like, their interests are not my interests, okay? That's a very helpful way of framing things. But at the end of the day, um, I don't really know anything about politics. I don't know anything about economics. And I am not actually involved practically in any way with anything. Um, you know, I'm not going out and going on strike, partly because I'm not even employed. I mean, maybe I would if my employment situation were different, but I'm not. Um, I'm not going out and going into protests. Uh, I sit at home in my room and I, I read philosophy and I will sometimes read, like I, I, I engage more with, if I'm engaging with political philosophy at all, I'll be engaging with like ideal theory. Um, but these kinds of applied questions about like, well, what should we do next? Um, I, I, I really couldn't care less. When it comes to the question of reform or revolution, I mean, I think that the context, so I, I think the context where like, here's the thing, my life is pretty good right now. Like everything's going okay. So I'm not inclined to favor like radically changing things. Sorry. Um, where I might be pushed towards favoring radical change is if if it turns out that things like you know, climate change, ocean acidification, resource depletion. I mean, who knows how bad those problems really are? Like, maybe those problems are worse than we think. And maybe that would require revolutionary change. Um, but, but really, like, if you want to, like, prompt me to, like, actually get involved in some sort of revolution, there's going to have to be something very bad with my life. Um, and they're just isn't. I mean, there just isn't. It's fine. So I'm not going to do anything. And I mean, I, yep, you can say that that's selfish and you can say that I'm a prick, but that's the way it is. Okay. Uh, Omar Saleh. Have you read Robert Brandom, John McDowell and the Pittsburgh School generally? What do you think of their approach to philosophy? Um, no, not really. I, I don't know them well enough to say anything uh, illuminating about them. How can a pragmatist be a scientific realist as well? I've heard of pragmatists like Sellers and maybe Quine described as scientific realists. If you're a pragmatist, how can you be committed to the existence of theoretical entities beyond thinking of them as a tool for prediction? So um, the, the problem with this is, first of all, pragmatism is a very broad tradition. There are many, many things that can be meant by pragmatism. Um, it, it, it's it's so it's it's I mean, defining what pragmatism is, is like trying to, you know, nail down smoke. It's, <laughs> it's, it's very tough. And I mean, I suppose that's the case with philosophical positions in general. There's always going to be debates about what exactly these positions are. But it's just, I, I think with pragmatism, it's, it's just much harder than usual. Um, that, that tradition is like split off in so many different ways. Um, but, okay, how can a pragmatist be a scientific realist? Well, scientific realism involves it's basically uh, involves a kind of positive epistemic attitude to our site to, to the sciences where we're saying you know uh, scientific theories are intended as descriptions of the world um we are justified in believing that some of those descriptions are true um that's the the basic idea right and that basic idea i think is totally consistent with with pragmatism um indeed if you're a pragmatist maybe you adopt a kind of deflationary theory of truth that seems to be like Pragmatists seem to be quite attracted to deflationary theories of truth. So on a deflationist theory of truth, what it is to say that something is true is basically just to... So what it is to say that P is true is basically just to assert that P, right? Like as long as P is assertable, we're going to say that P is true. Um, and on that kind of view, well, you know, it obviously claims about theoretical entities are assertable. Um, if, you, if you ask me, uh, like, what's the... 
what's the cause of the northern lights then i'm going to i'm going to give you an explanation that will appeal to things like electrons and uh charged particles and molecules in the atmosphere right um and that's and that's an explanation which is very well supported by the evidence it's an explanation that is you know it kind of meets all of the standards that we would have in at least normal inquiry right like it, in everyday inquiry the kind of standards of everyday inquiry the explanation i've given has going is going to meet those standards so it's going to be assertable and so a pragmatist might look at that and say well yeah that's that's just true right um and that seems to be on the more realist side um so i mean i guess one way to think about scientific realism is you know a scientific realist will say that entities like electrons are so these theoretical postulates they are on the same playing field as the entities that we describe in common sense so you know when i uh, i like i can talk about hands and cars and tables and chairs well the entities that are postulated by our scientific theories there's no fundamental distinction between these entities and additionally um there is some sense in which like claims about common sense entities are true well if you if you hold that combination of views then you know i don't know that seems that seems like a kind of realism so <clears throat> i mean it depends i suppose on what you take realism to be maybe if you think that realism involves like postulating a kind of transcendental world like an objective world or you know a world that's like completely independent of our inquiries and we're trying to describe that world like maybe that would be something that pragmatists would resist but if we just frame scientific realism you know more in terms of um okay like we are justified in believing in these entities we're justified in believing that these claims are true i think pragmatists can uh, can have that Okay, so uh, one asks, are you familiar with quantum mechanics? Which interpretation of it do you prefer and why? Um, I mean, familiar. I'm not, I'm not a physicist. I'm not exactly familiar with it. I, I have a uh, passing understanding of uh, some of the different interpretations of quantum mechanics. But, I mean, I'm a scientific anti-realist. I take it that scientific theories are tools, instruments for systematizing, predicting, controlling, observable phenomena. Uh, from that kind of, from that point of view, um, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe any particular interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, indeed, in general, you do not hold the attitude of belief towards scientific theories. Um, so, now that's not to say that one couldn't have preferences, but insofar as you adopt a particular interpretation of quantum mechanics, that would be um, I mean, it would be purely pragmatic. It would be like, well, maybe this interpretation is simpler. Maybe it allows for smoother inferences. Um, maybe it's just, you know, maybe it has m more aesthetic appeal. Um, that would be the grounds on which a decision between these different interpretations is made. But like from an anti-realist point of view, you could, okay, you do quantum mechanics. Let's say you adopt the many worlds interpretation. Well, maybe the many worlds interpretation is in some sense the best uh, of the different interpretations in the sense that it exhibits the best of you know it it, it best uh, exhibits the theoretical virtues um, but as an anti-realist you would just take it that okay we have a theory it's postulating you know, it's th these many worlds these alternative worlds are theoretical postulates. They're not things that are going to be observed. Rather, they're postulated in order to explain observations. And, you you know, you don't hold the attitude of belief to them. Um, so, I, I guess that's the answer to that one. Right, Patrick says, A rich patron offers you a large sum of money on the condition you spend the rest of your life doing philosophy work outside of an academic institution. You can still publish, attend conferences, all that, just not in the employ of a university. Do you accept... What would your work look like? Would you write books? Would you expand on your public philosophy, public education work? Well, obviously, I would take this in a heartbeat because uh, I'm already not part of an academic institution. I didn't manage to get a job in academia. So uh, 
this is I'm not having I don't have to give up anything in order to take this deal. Basically, what you're telling me is I'm being offered a bunch of money in order to just do what I'm already doing. Well, that would be wonderful. Um, now, I mean, there is, I admit, something sad about the fact that I didn't manage to make it. You know, I didn't I didn't manage to get an academic career because there's a kind of prestige associated with actually being employed at an academic institution and it would be nice to have that prestige i i i confess you know even even i uh i i find that somewhat attractive but then i don't know i mean there's also a degree of prestige in just having done a phd which i have done and to be honest there are many ways in which um i think having an academic job can be can be quite limiting i mean there's a lot of just bullshit that you have to deal with, like administrative bullshit, uh, answering lots of emails and uh, dealing with just the, uh, I mean, I mean, just sort of, yeah, dealing with the administrative side of things. Uh, also, I think if you're part of academic institutions, I mean, you, your time is going to be a bit more constrained in terms of, well, you know, you have to do a certain amount of teaching, you, um, you have to pursue research projects that um are like likely to get research funding or you have to um you have to kind of do philosophy in accordance with the sorts of standards that currently prevail in these institutions you know you have to write articles now i can say that the process of writing articles is totally miserable and it's not really clear to me that the sorts of standards that we have in uh, philosophy journals are actually are actually sort of promoting philosophy as a subject. Um, I, I think that the sort the ways that we approach philosophy publication these days are somewhat pathological. Um, but you have to play the game. You have to play the game if you're in academia. And frankly, a lot of that game is miserable. So sometimes I feel bad. Sometimes I feel like, yeah, yeah, it's bad because I don't have the prestige. But then sometimes I think, you know what, I've got it pretty damn good. If this uh, patron did offer me the money, oh my, well, that, that would just be, that would be ideal. It would be heaven. So I absolutely would accept it. I mean, I would carry on doing what I'm doing. I think I probably would spend some time, um, you know, writing books. I would, I would expand a little bit. I would, uh, um, I don't know, I, w I would just look for, you know, other ways of reaching other parts of the public. Um, I would probably not bother doing the private tutoring. Um, I mean, honestly, the reason why I do that is because I need money. It's a way of making money. Um, and although it is certainly enjoyable and it's a way of, you know, using the skills that I've learned, um, it, there's a reason why you get paid to do it, right? It's it's ultimately, if if it was just up to me, I would spend my time doing slightly different things. Um, I mean, you can reach more people uh, doing public outreach work than you can with a sort of one-on-one -on -one tutoring thing. Um, okay then, so yeah, I'd probably stop doing that, but um, otherwise I'd kind of carry on with, with what I'm doing. Um, maybe a few other things. Uh, Pauline 99 asks, has the Industrial Revolution and its consequences been a disaster for the human race? So I guess this is in reference to Ted Kaczynski. Um, I mean, I, I don't think so. I, I ultimately, I don't, I, I think Kaczynski's interesting. I think his arguments are somewhat overstated. I mean, the, the, the fundamental issue is, so, okay, well, one of the, the main things that Kaczynski points out, of course, is this, uh, is this kind of loss of autonomy in the face of increasing, um, it, it, you know, these increasingly sophisticated technological systems where the technological systems are such that um, they, you initially develop technologies in order to solve problems and in order to, I suppose, you know, the, the reason why you like develop technology is because you see a problem, you want to solve the problem and, you know, you think, okay, this is going to make life easier for me. So obviously if you uh, imagine trying to, um, I don't know, hunt and gather your own food uh, and then you have to prepare the food yourself, as you develop technology, you can start to increase crop yields, you can make the process of getting food quicker, right? It, things become faster, right? And so you think, okay, if I deal with those necessities of life and I, I, I can deal with those problems more quickly and more easily and, and faster, then that should give me more freedom, right? Like that's the, that's the ideal, right? Technology solves problems and gives us more freedom. 
But the issue is, is that pretty much every technological development will bring with it a whole load of other problems, unforeseen problems, and it will also end up restricting our freedom in unexpected ways. Um, so like as soon as you develop things such as motorized transport, well, that transforms society in such a way that everybody's life becomes kind of governed by the sorts of rules of motorized transport. Like, first of all, everybody has to get a car. Everybody has to follow the rules of the road. And so do you have greater freedom? Do you have greater autonomy? You know, what actually happens is you end up being this kind of cog in a machine where nobody has any kind of control over the, uh, over, <laughs> over the, the machine itself. Um, like no individual even, even really understands how that machine works or can have any kind of influence on it. So, I, I, and okay, right, with all of that said, yeah, I mean, I can see the point, right? There is a question here about, well, in what sense are we really promoting autonomy? In what sense are we really promoting freedom? Um, but the problem is, is that I think that what's, I think that what Kaczynski's really getting at here is just that our lives and our options are going to be radically constrained by the sorts of environments that we're in. And to be honest, I, I don't really see a difference in kind between, you know, the way in which my options are constrained by a technological society and the way in which my options would be constrained by living in a hunter-gatherer society. Um, like, there's lots of things that I can do in a technological society that I can't do in a hunter-gatherer society and vice versa. I mean... So, I mean, maybe it's just that the idea of like quantifying freedom and autonomy is kind of nonsensical. Um, you know, it, okay, in technological societies, yes, there's this sense that my life is being governed by these mass technological systems outside of my control. But then if you're in a hunter-gatherer society, uh, similarly, a lot of what happens in life is going to be governed by just stuff going on in the environment that's outside of your control you know like maybe one day there's like a flash flood or a storm or a hurricane or something it's completely outside of your control you don't really even understand what's going on um so anyway um yeah i, I look I, I i i like the uh i like kaczynski's work i, I mean at least the, the philosophical claims that he's making i don't like the practical things he did but there are interesting points there ultimately i think it's overstated but i'm not you know, I, I mean, I, I'm not like pro technology. I think it's very unclear whether whether the development of a technological society is actually going to turn out to be a good thing. Um, I don't think there's been any serious disasters yet, but it probably things probably I, I don't think it's probably I don't think it's been as good as it's sometimes presented as being. Um, and there could well be very serious disasters in the future. Um, so, I mean, I guess that I, I suppose I just exist in a sort of state of doubt. I hope it would be nice if everything works out, but that really seems like an article of faith to me. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't really buy into the idea of a, a any kind of historical arc of progress. Let's put it that way. But I also don't buy into some historical arc of uh, decline. You know, things have changed and in some ways gotten better, in many ways gotten better. Certainly from, you know, me and the kind of society I live in, I think it's probably better. Um, but I, I certainly take my life now over living as a hunter-gatherer. Um, pay Poten. Through which processes do we humans naturally expand our knowledge? Well, I don't think there's any, there's any particular rule for this. I mean, it's going to be a matter of, look, uh, we, we perceive things, we form beliefs on the basis of what we perceive, we, uh, we remember things, we form beliefs on the basis of that, we talk to other people, um, other, other people like say stuff, they testify, about things and then we form beliefs on that basis i mean these are these are the sorts of these are the sorts of things that happen right um and then you can you can just elaborate on those basic processes yeah i don't i don't know i mean like th okay through which processes do we naturally expand knowledge i mean if we have knowledge i would have thought it's just through those you know th i i feel like this is a very trivial answer so maybe i'm misunderstanding the question but I'm, I'm not sure, like, maybe you mean something else. Let me know if I've misunderstood the question. But um, 
yeah, the answer is like, well, through things we perceive, through talking to other people, um, through performing experiments, through, you know, like sometimes those experiments will be uh, manipulating concrete objects, manipulating nature. Sometimes it's thought experiments. Um, we kind of look at the results of those experiments and then we weigh the results of those experiments against our background beliefs and our broader theoretical commitments. We weigh them against the other things we've heard from other people. Um, <laughs> that's, that's how it usually works. Okay, Pete R. If suffering is good for personal development, is it right to make people suffer? Um, I mean, it's an interesting question, right? Because uh, it's, it's plausible, I think very plausible, that some sort of suffering could have positive consequences for a person's life. Um, you know, when, when I think about, like, if you, if you look at people who have been born into wealth and privilege, there's some sense in which, of course, you envy them, right? Like, you envy, uh, you, you envy the fact, right, that they have all of this wealth, that they have so many material resources. But very often, it seems like there's something quite shallow about their existence. Um, you know, there was one, uh, so, so, so like one way that this can manifest is um, in a kind of uh, uh, sort of like narcissism or psychopathy, where it seems like, it does seem to be the case, and I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but like if you take, if you take like very, very rich people, um, there's no, there's no conflict. There's no real conflict in their lives. There's no real struggle in their lives, right? But if you, if, and so I'm talking people born into wealth. If you look at people who are born into very great wealth, then really they, they just have no real struggle, no real conflict. Um, I mean, not about anything that actually like matters, not about, you know, conflict. So of course, people disagree on in all walks of life, but I'm talking about, you know, like actual struggles about like, okay, I, oh my God, I need to get food to survive. I need to get money to live. You know, I need to pay the bills, that kind of thing. That's just not something they have. They're going to be probably surrounded by yes men. Um, they've got no struggles. And what that means is, is that there's no need to make any real compromises with people. You never have, you never have to like learn how to, uh, sacrifice things that are important to you you never have to like if somebody if somebody's just annoying you and you're super wealthy you can just cut them out of your life and replace them with someone else um there's just no need to make these sorts of compromises that uh people of the lower classes will have to make and so it's it that can i think very easily lead to just looking at other people treating other people as just kind of you know, objects, right? Uh, right? Like, okay, they're just, they're just things to sort of satisfy my desires. Um, it may, it may well be the case then that like, engaging in this kind of compromise and sacrifice and having to interact with people that you might not really like, um, that is maybe important in the development of things like empathy. Um, I don't know, maybe not. Um, but that seems plausible. Um, and, and more generally, I mean, there's plenty of like, you know, art, for instance, like brilliant art that's been a result of suffering. So, OK, with all of that said, is it is it right to make people suffer? <laughs> it's kind of weird that we might say, well, suffering is good for your personal development. So maybe we should just like like if I come across somebody who hasn't really suffered in their life, if I come across somebody who has uh being born into incredible wealth and has never had to make any compromises, never had to make any sacrifices. Maybe I should just like break their legs or something because uh, that would <laughs> that would help their personal development. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. Um, I think that the reality is there's probably more than enough suffering in the world as it is. I mean, life is so look, maybe suffering is good for personal development in to some degree, right? But but the, the the just amount of like horror there is in the world, um, it it's more than enough. I uh, so I think really the focus should be on reducing that rather than increasing it. Um, and then maybe you know if one day we find ourselves in a world where there's just not enough suffering for the sort of development we would like to see, well we can cross that bridge when we come to it. 
Um, random dude, why are you a relativist about truth? Is relativism true regardless of perspective? So, I mean, I think, okay, um, the case for relativism about truth, I, I have made that in previous videos. You can check out um, uh, my video on like classification and kinds, my video on the language of nature. Um, I've got a video called Science, Truth and Complexity, which talks about it. I've got uh, oh, a video called Relativism and Truth. Um, so if you want the, the actual answer, go and check out those. But I mean, broadly speaking, um, there's, there's a few different uh, motivations, I suppose. I mean, one motivation involves, um, you, you know, OK, we can we can sort of look at uh, we can like look at the sciences, look at how knowledge is actually generated and argue that it turns out that, you know, given different sort of background assumptions or different values, you end up supporting very different theories um, like that sort of thing is going to be one motivation for relativism about truth. Another I mean, that's so there's sort of like a bottom up argument where you say, OK, let's look at our actual practices. Like, how do we generate knowledge? Um, and it turns out that those practices are going are like highly context dependent. You know, like the, the theories that are generated are true only given certain background assumptions. So they're true relative to that perspective. Right. So that's the sort of bottom up argument. You You look at specific practices and try to show that, you know, relativism follows from them. Um, then there are more like kind of top down arguments where you can say, so one of the things I've argued is that actually the most plausible versions of the different theories of truth entail relativism. So I think that um, the correspondence theory of truth, for instance, uh, the traditional correspondence theory of truth faces a lot of very serious problems. Um, and I would suggest the best solution to those problems is relativism. So one of the issues, for instance, with the correspondence theory of truth is um, there are going to be uh, many different relations between propositions in the world. OK, so what the correspondence theory says is, well, P is true just in case P matches the way the world is. But but notice that like this, this idea of something matching the way the world is, well, that means that there's some sort of relation between the proposition and the world. So when I say the sky is blue, well, there's a relation between the sky is blue and the world. Um, but now if I say the sky is red, we want to say that's false. But of course, there's still a relation between the sky is red and the world. In the case of the sky is red, we would say it's a falsity making relation, but it's still a relation. And so the question is like, well, what like what counts as the relevant type of relation to make something true? Um, that is an issue for correspondence theory. And then that, I think, opens up some space for an argument for relativism. Um, so, yeah, I mean, similarly, you can appeal to things like uh, the fact that all of our knowledge, arguably, involves a sort of idealization and approximation and simplification. Um, and then what counts as an appropriate, like, so like what, so when we say that certain things are say, approximately true, what counts as it as true enough, as it were? What counts as an appropriate degree of idealization? Well, that's going to be dependent on our values. Um, so those were some, I mean, again, I've been, this is all very simplified, but that, that's, those are some of the motivations for relativism about truth. But again, I've talked about in much more detail in earlier videos. You say, is relativism true regardless of perspective? Well, no, not according to a relativist. Relativism says that uh, propositions have a truth value only relative to some perspective or other. So the claim relativism is true is itself going to be true only relative to some perspective. Of course, the, 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 the hope would be that we can engage in a conversation and I can present reasons to support relativism, which you yourself will accept. <laughs> so, you know, the, 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 the line that's often made in response to this idea that relativism is true only relative to some perspective is, oh, well, that means that absolutism is true relative to the absolutist's perspective. <sighs> I mean, I, OK, but the the point is, is that you may well have commitments where, like, I can then give an argument to show that your commitments entail relativism. 
so that's the case with what I've just done with the correspondence theory of truth, right? There's lots of people who buy the correspondence theory of truth and they want to be absolutists. But then I can say, well, no, hang on a minute. When you think about the correspondence theory of truth and you think about some of these problems, doesn't that actually lead to relativism? So per your own perspective, you end up being committed to relativism as well. Um, okay, uh, why do you reject inference to the best explanation? Well, I think that, uh, again, this is, a, this is again something I've talked about in much more detail in other videos. Um, I mean, this, there's, okay, two big problems. Um, first of all, there's the, the so-called problem of the bad lot. So let's assume that inference to the best explanation uh, is truth tracking in the sense that um, if you have a set of explanations and the true explanation is among those explanations, let's assume that if you apply this method of inference to the best explanation, this will successfully select, reliably select the true explanation most of the time. Okay, just to grant that for the sake of argument. Well, the problem is, why should we think that the true explanation is among the explanations that we have considered? I mean, nothing in the, the procedure of inference to the best explanation itself is going to ensure that. Um, you know, you could just have a bunch of really shoddy explanations and then inference to the best explanation. Well, it takes you to the best one, but it's not going to take you to the true one because you don't have the true explanation among the explanations that you are considering. Um, so uh, I should say, you know, when we talk about like rejecting inference to the best explanation, I want to be very clear that what, what's being rejected here is the claim that the best explanation is therefore true. So what I'm rejecting is uh, applying inference to the best explanation and then believing the explanation that we select, believing that it's true. That's what I have a problem with. But I don't really have any problem with, like, just in general, inferring to the best explanation and accepting the best explanation in some weaker sense than belief. So, I mean, look, I believe various things about the world and I'm quite happy to accept, like, various scientific theories about the way the world is. Um, I accept them in the sense that, you know, I, I sort of use them as a picture of the world, as a, as a useful map, right? It's like a map. It's like having a map of the world. And then using that map, you can make various predictions. You can do various things. It can guide you in various ways. Um, in that sense, inference to the best explanation is totally fine. So, but anyway, I mean, so what, what, we're, what we're saying, what we object to um, is uh, believing that it's true. Um, okay, so that's that's one point. I mean, the other point is just, um, I, I don't think that inference to the best explanation is actually truth tracking. So even if you do have the true explanation among the set of explanations, um, the what we do when we when we perform an inference to the best explanation is that we are weighing the various theories uh, against our theoretical, uh, we're judging them against theoretical virtues. So this would be things like simplicity, explanatory scope, um, consistency, etc. right? Different philosophers will give a different list of what these theoretical virtues are. Um, but I think that there are pretty compelling arguments um, that these, the, the virtues that we used in judging these theories are not actually truth conducive. There's no reason to think that simplicity, in the sense that simplicity is meant in uh, in in these contexts of more sophisticated inquiry, there's no reason to think that that's truth conducive. Um, so yeah, that's basically the reason. Uh, okay, since you don't believe in epistemic justification, how would you argue against someone who gets all of their beliefs by consulting a crystal ball? Are they irrational, and if so, why? I think that this particular example is is just not well developed enough for me to really have an opinion about it. I mean. How would I argue against somebody who gets their beliefs by consulting a crystal ball? Well, maybe I should ask you, uh, how would you argue against someone who gets their beliefs that way? I mean, it, like, I, I actually don't think it really makes that much of a difference whether we adopt a relativist or objectivist view of truth here. Or, or, or Right, so, oh, wait, no, this is about epistemic justification. Well, okay, look, my point, okay, um, sorry. So I don't think it's going to make much difference whether we are, you know, realists or anti-realists about epistemic justification here. Um, obviously, even as somebody who's an anti-realist about epistemic justification, I still 
engage in discussions. I still give reasons for my beliefs and I like it when other people give reasons for their beliefs and, you know, we can sort of talk and I can, I can cite these reasons as things that have compelled me to believe what I believe um, and other people can tell me why they believe what they believe, right? Um, and then you might well change minds in the course of that discussion. It's not, now that discussion can happen regardless of whether you think that like epistemic justification is a real thing in the same way. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very much analogous to the situation in metaethics, where even if you're a moral anti-realist, um, you can still engage in moral debates. You can still use the terms right and wrong, and you can still say that people ought to do things or ought not to do things. Um, and in fact, the sorts of reasons that you give in favour of the moral views that you have can be much the same as the reasons that realists give in favour of uh, the moral views that they have. So um, I think it's just, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same when we're talking about um, reasons for belief. Uh, I have various reasons for believing the things I do. Now, if I was talking to somebody who gets their beliefs by consulting a crystal ball, well, okay, I need to know more about this scenario. So um, are we talking about somebody who is kind of otherwise part of uh, a, a kind of Western scientific uh, background? Like, so, it, you know, is, is this somebody who has the same sort of educational history that I did? Did they like grow up in the UK and they were, you know, taught the contemporary scientific worldview? If I'm talking to someone like that, then, you know, okay, there are, there are, there are arguments one can make, right? You can appeal to the accepted physical theories, whatever. You can make those sorts of arguments. I mean, I suppose actually the first step would just be to ask them, well, like, why do you trust the crystal ball? Um, if they don't trust it, then there would be a question about, okay, well, you know, like, why are you forming your beliefs that way, whatever. So, but, but there's that sort of person, right? And th but then there's the person who just is coming from a completely like radically different sort of tradition. You know, you imagine somebody in a, uh, you know, like a, a hunter gatherer tribe where um, they, they, they have totally different beliefs about cosmology, uh, totally different kind of views about the nature of causality, right? Like causal connections between things. I mean, the way that you argue against these people would be very different, right? If, you, if your aim was to convince them to stop relying on the crystal ball, the way that you do that is going to be very different. And I think that's going to be the case regardless of whether you believe in epistemic justification or not. Um, when it comes to these sorts of first order inquiries, you can approach them in pretty much the same way, regardless of whether you believe in epistemic justification. Um, so that would be what I would say to that. Rug Merchant asks, thoughts on occasionalism? Well, I, I just, uh, I don't see any reason to take it seriously. Um, I don't think that it helps in any way to illuminate the nature of causality. Um, so causality is very mysterious, right? Uh, and, you know, maybe we want to just be like anti-realist about causality. I'm inclined to be a kind of anti-realist about causality, but certainly causality is mysterious. Lots of philosophical problems there. Um, now saying that, well, all of the causal work is being done by God, that to me does not resolve any of those philosophical problems. All it does is just introduce this new entity, God, which has a whole bunch of philosophical problems of its own. So, yeah, I, I'm not inclined uh, to, to, to take occasionalism very uh, seriously. Um, okay, Scrubbles by DJ Gunbound. Any interest in reading uh, Proclo and Plotinus or uh, about the Kyoto School? Uh, not really the first two. With respect to the Kyoto School, I've, I've, yeah, I've heard of them and I would like to learn more about them. But uh, unfortunately, it's quite low down the list and I'm, I don't have enough time in my life to get through even 1% of the list. So I don't know whether I will ever get around to the Kyoto School. Um, Semi Mojo, what's your favourite book in the bookshelf behind you? Uh, SJSU philosopher, what's the most logical explanation for the fact that there is no US stamp, US coin or US currency with either Neil Armstrong's name or Neil Armstrong's face on it? 
I think it's that um, that going to the moon was uh, was a total waste of time, and uh, and you know the U.S. lost the space race, right? Like the Soviet Union blew you guys out of the water when it came to the space race in general, right? But the thing is, is what you did, you did this kind of clever little move where it was like, ah, well, actually what counts as winning the space race is getting to the moon, right? Now, of course, getting to, like sending a person to the moon is, it's not particularly impressive. It doesn't, it doesn't give us any new information. Um, it's, it's purely superficial, right? Like this is, it's just performance, okay? That's all it is. Sending somebody to the moon is just a piece of performance. It's not actually interesting. It's not advancing science in any particularly interesting ways, you know. So, and when you look at the space race in general, okay, when you look at like, okay, well, who got like the first person in space, the first animals in space, who sent the first satellites up, who was, you know, the first to study Venus, etc. right? If you look at the, act, the like the list of, things that happened and when they happened. I mean, the Soviet Union was just winning the whole way. But then, oh, the US sent somebody to the moon. And so it's like everybody decides that that counts as the like, oh, you're the real winners because you sent somebody to the moon. N no, it's it's not impressive. Um, and uh, you didn't win the space race. The Soviet Union did. So I think what's going on here is that you as a country are collectively aware of this. You don't admit it openly to yourselves. But you are you are aware that that you got crushed by the Soviet Union. Um, you are aware that your win in the space race was superficial performance, and you you don't put him on your currency because really you would prefer to forget that whole national embarrassment. That's what that was. Okay, it was embarrassing, and you should feel embarrassed if you're in the U.S. Um, okay, what's the most logical? explanation for why the Irish suffered so many dead in the Irish famine of the 1840s when Ireland is an island with rivers, streams, brooks, lakes, ponds, marshes, etc. and thus had all the fish and worms around to eat. So um, I don't know the history of the Irish famine but um, my guess would be this and this is going to be the case for a lot of famines as well. Um, number one, as civilizations grow um, you, so like as, as human societies shift from, you know, hunter-gatherer life to agricultural life, what happens is that the food yield increases, so the population expands. But now you end up, it end, what tends to end up happening is, is that the population becomes dependent on, so you have an expanded population and it becomes dependent on um, a very specific food source or like very small set of food sources to survive. Um, so what that means is, is that if those systems break down, if the civilization breaks down or, you know, if there are uh, droughts or something so that, you know, there's you, you can't farm anymore, um, there just won't be enough food available in that area to sustain the population of that size. I mean, just consider wherever you live. I don't know where you live, but I mean, you know, I, I don't live in a city. I live in a village. But, you know, if we had to survive by hunting and foraging, most of the people here would die. Like hundreds of people would die because there simply is not enough food in this area to sustain the current, the current population that we have. So similarly, you know, somewhere like Ireland, well, um, the big thing was uh, was potatoes, I'm told. Right. It was a potato famine. Um, so, OK, once you're no longer able to grow potatoes. You just might not have enough food, even though, yes, you've got the rivers and streams and brooks and lakes. There's a limit to how much, to how large a population that can sustain. Um, so growing potatoes enabled this massive expansion of the population. And then once you can't grow potatoes anymore, you can't feed them all. And so they die. Um, the other thing is, is that you, when you have the growth of civilization, you get increasing specialization and people become specialized um, in the sorts of techniques and technologies that are associated with that civilization. So, um, you know, and, and very often, I mean, if you're like, if, if you're living in, you know, as like a peasant or as uh, the, you know, you're sort of living at a subsistence level, you're not, you're probably not going to have time in your life to learn lots of other things. So what tends to happen is, is that you lose the, uh, the skills and the methods that would have supported previous ways of life. 
So as human beings shift from the hunter-gatherer life to the agricultural life, you just lose those skills that would have supported hunter-gatherer life. So there may well have, even if there was enough food available to support the population, it, they, people probably didn't know how to fish and hunt and forage and so on effectively, because I'm assuming that people in Ireland at that time were mostly farmers. It's a very different set of skills. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, at the time in Ireland, people would have been dependent on a single crop, potatoes. Without potatoes, there's not enough food to sustain the population. And even if there wa w was enough food out there, they lacked the skills to acquire it. That would be my guess. Um, and I would guess that this is also going to explain a lot of other famines as well. Of course, I'm aware that this is just completely ignoring the social, political circumstances. Um, but I don't know anything about that. So, uh, you know, no comment. Um, what's the most logical explanation for why the Donner Party resorted to cannibalism when there were so many fish in the lake nearby, uh, now named Donner Lake? Um, from, the, from what I've read of the whole thing about the Donner Party, they, they seem to just be a, like a bunch of idiots. Um, like they seem to be really profoundly stupid. Um, and so I think that that's sometimes a reasonable explanation, right? Like sometimes the best explanation for why people died or why they resorted to things like cannibalism is, it, is just, oh, actually they were just idiots. Um, and my, I remember reading a little bit about the Donner Party and thinking, wow, these people seem like idiots. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, Scoob asks, favorite thought experiment? That is an interesting question. Um, what have we got, man? We got the trolley problem. We've got the Chinese room. We've got Mary's room. We've got the twin earth. Oh God, not the twin earth. Um, I, we got charmers, zombies. Um, I don't know. The experience machine, right? Like these are some, I'm just thinking of what thought experiments there are. Um, I should do like a thought experiment tier list. That would be fun, wouldn't it? That would be a fun video. But um, off the top of my head, I really don't know. Um, I mean, I'm kind of inclined to say Newcomb's problem just because I find it like actually really fun. I, I, find, uh, I like how people have, you know, really strong opinions about Newcomb's problem but the opinions are always like split 50-50. You know, everybody thinks it's just obvious what should be. This is the thing, like, as Nozick said about it, everybody who encounters the problem thinks it is perfectly clear and obvious what should be done, but they split 50-50, and each half just thinks that the other half is being completely crazy and irrational. I like that. Um, I, it's, it's a fun problem to talk about. But, I mean, I, I don't know if, like, because I don't really buy into a lot of the underlying assumptions of decision theory, you know, like a lot of people use Newcomb's problem as like a tool for exploring decision theory. And that's not, I'm not really interested in it for that, for that purpose. Uh, <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, maybe the trolley problem, because there's so many different variations of the trolley problem and it's just fun. I mean, I have that video on absurd trolley problems but like, actually, it really is just fun to talk about. And I, you know what, it probably is a good tool for, you know, revealing our um, underlying moral principles, or our at least our moral intuitions. I mean, it is a good tool for probing that. So m maybe that one. Um, <clears throat> any thoughts on necessitarianism? Just came across the grounding argument, which raises the puzzle of what contingency could be grounded in necessary or contingent metaphysical facts. If necessary facts, how does that work? If contingent facts looks like an infinite regress, neither option seems like a good one. So uh, yeah, I take it that if the if the contingency is grounded in necessary facts, then we seem to have, it seems kind of weird. Like if you're explaining contingency by appealing to metaphysic to necessary facts, then it looks like they're not going to be contingent. Like either you haven't given a complete explanation or if you have given a complete explanation, those contingent facts are not going to be contingent anymore because they're just going to follow from the necessary facts, right? Like, that's the issue with that one. But then if you say, well, the contingent facts are grounded in other contingent facts, then that just is this infinite regress that goes back forever. But here's the thing. I just don't see the problem with that kind of infinite regress. Seems fine to me. Um, so I wouldn't 
favour that kind of argument for necessitarianism. Um, so I wonder, you know, there's, I mean, okay, there's this grounding argument that raises the puzzle of what contingency could be grounded in. But isn't there going to be a similar argument about, well, what is the necessity grounded in? Like, like what, what grounds the necessity? That's a perfectly, that seems like a perfectly reasonable question. I mean, so, so, okay, there are, there are some contingent facts and there are some necessary facts. And in general, I can ask, well, like, when I'm facing a contingent fact, like the sky is blue, okay, that's contingent. I can ask what grounds that fact. But then if we're talking about necessary facts, so like, it's, it's necessary, like the fact that it's necessary that like, if I have, you know, 24 strawberries, I can't, um, sorry, if I have 25 strawberries, I can't divide those strawberries equally among two people, um, at least without cutting a strawberry. Um, so that's a necessary fact, but I can simply say what grounds that necessary fact. So there can still be questions about what's grounding necessary facts. And then that means that this problem that you have um, noted uh, is going to arise there because you either say that the necessary facts are grounded in contingent facts, which would be kind of hilarious, or you say the necessary facts are grounded in necessary facts, but then you're off on an infinite regress. Um, okay, so Sig. Uh, seeing as you're in a field of extremely active thinking and mental taxation, how do you keep up and dissect many of the works you go into? Um, well, the answer is I don't. I don't. I, I'm not able to read even 1% of what I want to read. I'm not able to read most of what I should read. And I really do mean that because when I was doing my degree and my master's and my PhD, I didn't read most, like... I, I would read, like, maybe, I mean, 20% of what I was supposed to read. <laughs> like, I didn't have time to to read it all. Even when I was teaching the material, I, like, I would maybe read, I don't know, 40% of it. I, like, like, stuff that I was teaching, I didn't read it all. Okay, and what I'm saying here is true for everybody. I mean, maybe they won't all admit it, but I think it's true for all of them. Um, it is... Uh, it, you can't keep up with it. And so what you need to do is kind of come up with strategies that make it look as if you're able to keep up with it. Um, that maybe will involve, you know, reading secondary literature, talking to people, getting their assessments of what the areas of the field look like. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's not enough time in a person's life to uh, to, to do all of it. Right, um, SXYLA asks, is logic logical? Uh, I'm not sure how to approach that question. I mean, it's sort of my my intellect. I mean, I, I would like yes. I I guess I I'm not really sure what's being asked there. Um, is logic is logic itself logical? I mean, logic is like it's just logic. Like I mean, if I'm doing some formal logic, and then you're like, well, is that logical? I mean, yeah, it's just that's formal logic. There you go. Um, I, I don't know how to, how to approach this, uh, question. Sorry. Um, maybe you could clarify what you have in mind and, uh, I could answer in the comments, but, um, yeah. Um, all right. Um, Tanishku Saini, what do you do in your free time? Well, I listen to music. I, uh, I watch stuff. I watch things on YouTube. I... Uh, I watch Doctor Who. Um, I'm a big fan of the the early Doctor Who's, Doctor Who from 1963 to 1989. I mean, the modern series is fun, but I I don't really care about it. The so yeah, I I, I watch Doctor Who. I watch uh, Star Trek: The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine in particular. I like those. Um, so you know, I'll I'll watch some TV shows. I might occasionally watch movies. I don't watch a lot of movies anymore. Um, I sometimes do exercise. Uh, I eat. I have a fairly boring life, um, to be honest. I talk to people, the people that I know and love. I will sometimes have conversations with them. But yeah, my life is pretty dull. Um, so most of the time I just spend it in my room listening to music or watching things or talking to people. Um, and that's it. TOTO asks, how much do you bench? I don't bench. I think you're referring to lifting things, um, which I, I don't do. 
Um, the Wib. What is your opinion on aletheic pluralism and quietist, non-reductive normative realism similar to that proposed by Scanlon and Parfit? I really want to do a video on um, this kind of quietist realism. Um, I keep meaning to do it, but, you know, there's just other things that, that get in the way. Um, sometimes it's called relaxed realism. Sometimes it's called non-realist cognitivism. I think that was the, the term the terminology that Parfit preferred. And I think it's quite telling that nobody really seems to know whether this is a kind of realism or a kind of non-realism. Um, my question, so the, the big, I mean, the big problem I have with this sort of relaxed realism or quietist realism is how is this not just anti-realism? Um, so the claim is that moral judgments express beliefs, but there are no moral properties and there's nothing in the world that makes moral judgments true, right? Like that's the big thing for Parfit, okay? Moral, moral truths do not reduce to natural facts and moreover, there are no like objective non-natural moral properties. Okay, so there are these non-natural truths, but there are, there's nothing in the world that makes them true. So, so like, okay, yeah, we, we express beliefs, um, but there's no moral properties, nothing in the world that makes them true, but here's the rub. Nevertheless, some moral claims are true. I mean, at best, at best, that's puzzling. Um, at worst, that's almost, that's just like a refusal to engage with the, the philosophical problems, right? The philosophical questions. It comes across as being like, what's happening here is, I, like, this guy just has the desire to use the word true. I mean, which, of course, if you want to use the word true, I can't stop you. But like, okay, let's say we, we kind of get into the, 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 the details of this. So... What do we mean by truth? Well, if we're adopting a kind of correspondence theory of truth, then it looks like you just straightforwardly get error theory here. I, I can't, I mean, like, there's not going to be a distinction between this and error theory, right? Because, moral, okay, moral judgments express beliefs, but there's no moral properties. There's nothing in the world that makes those beliefs true. So if you have a correspondence theory of truth where for a proposition to be true is for it to match the states of affairs in the world, and then you're saying that nothing in the world makes these moral claims true, then... That's just error theory, right? Um, they just there, there wouldn't be any moral truths. So, okay, that doesn't work. If you combine it with a deflationary theory of truth, well, now I think you get the trouble from the other direction because, okay, yeah, so if, if you accept a deflationist theory of truth, then sure, um, you know, you, the, the, the relaxed realist, the quietest realist can have moral truth. But the problem is... For, given a deflationary theory of truth, so can the error theorist. If the error theorist accepts deflationism, then she can also help herself to this idea that there are moral truths. Um, like, all, all the error theorist would need to say is that, well, some of these moral claims are assertable, and error theorists do say that. Um, I mean, not all of them, right? There are, okay, there are some error theorists who are moral abolitionists, but the vast majority of error theorists are not moral abolitionists. Most error theorists will will say that actually it's totally appropriate, totally fine, you know, even justified for us to make moral claims. Okay, well, if you combine that with a deflationary theory of truth, it looks like moral truth just drops out um, as just a consequence of that, right? So, I mean, we, like, I just really struggle to distinguish this position from you know, other positions in the literature, in particular from just straight up error theory. I, I, I don't know what this is offering beyond that. And, um, you know, again, like, okay, uh, maybe I should read more about it, but it's, it's not a position I find intuitively very appealing. And I, I really don't think, to, like, frankly, this doesn't seem like a position that's going to be giving realists what they seem to want. Because really, like, the debate about like moral realism, moral anti-realism, it's not a debate just about like, well, can we use the word true? I mean, <laughs> I mean, no, like, like, like what we, it seems to me that like what, what these, what realists want, generally speaking, is like that it to be the case that like, no, this is, there's, there's something, you know, in the world or like the facts, like there are moral properties, you know, um, and, and that is what is, kind of guiding or constraining our moral judgments, like our moral judgments are tracking that. Now, okay, you can have 
some concept of moral truth that doesn't require that. But I mean, really, you, you know, you already get that. Like that's that's something you can get from constructivists. That's something you can get from quasi-realists. That's even something you can get from error theorists. Like if the error theorist adopts a uh, deflationary theory of truth, I think even error theorists um, can can have that. So I, yeah, I mean, I, I, as I said, I don't find it that appealing. Um, but um, maybe I should clarify. Um, I think that the the key <laughs> the the key point here is. Um, so I said like error theorists can help themselves to moral truth. That might sound like it's just uh, well, it, it like wouldn't isn't that just incoherent? I mean, like I I would take it that um, what the error theorist would say is well, moral judgments express beliefs about objective moral properties, but there are no objective moral properties. So. Uh, Again, correspondence theory, if you adopt a correspondence theory, you will then say that there are no moral truths. But um, you could have the error theoretic claim that, you know, moral, so moral judgments express beliefs about objective moral properties, but there are no objective moral properties. You can have that kind of error theoretic claim. So the cognitivism and the claim that these are beliefs about objective moral properties. But in addition, there could be moral truths if you have a weaker conception of truth. And I think that that would, I, I mean, I, I think that would have a legitimate claim to being a type of error theory, because there is an error. The error is belief in these objective moral properties. I mean, maybe that's the difference between, um, you know, the, uh, the, the quietist non-realist or the quietest realist and the error theorist, right? Like the error theorist says, well, these are beliefs about objective moral properties, but there's no objective moral properties. The quietest realist says, um, their beliefs, but not beliefs about objective properties. So there's no error. Maybe. I mean, but, but really, the, the point is, is that it seems to me that the, the picture of the world that is being offered by these two frameworks is basically the same. You know, like, ultimately, nothing in the world makes our moral claims true. That's the important point. I think that's, the, to me, it seems like you've conceded pretty much everything. To the anti-realist if you say that um okay uh the real x one ras extras i don't know maybe that's what that is how did you decide you wanted to dedicate yourself to philosophy it happened by accident yeah just accident um it wasn't really a decision it was just i didn't know what to do with my life um when I was nearing the end of my time in uh, in school, I, I had to make a decision about what to do, and I didn't really want to get an actual job, so I thought, well, yeah, makes sense to go to university. And the question is, what do I do at university? And, well, philosophy seemed the most appealing. Um, that was basically how it happened. So it was kind of accidental. I, I wasn't somebody who was, like, deeply into philosophy um, when I was a teenager, although I was interested in it. I did read philosophy as a teenager, but I read lots of other things as well. Like I had, I think I had much broader interests when I was a teenager and then they've kind of narrowed as I've gotten older. Um, so maybe it was kind of an accident. Um, I might have done something else. Uh, who knows? Okay. Um, the cyborg, do you engage with Deleuze, Lacan and, and philosophy aiming at making people act instead of pure rational, abstract thinking, or do you keep to the structures of classical philosophy? Okay, first of all, I am, I don't know much about Deleuze or Lacan, but I am very sceptical that they are interested in making people act. I think if that was their goal, they weren't very effective at achieving it, at the very least. Um, like, I can't, when, when I think about the sort of philosophy that's aimed towards, like, practical action, I mean, Deleuze and Lacan are way down the list. But again, I don't really know that much about them. So maybe, you know, maybe I'm just missing something. That is entirely possible. Um, so do I engage with that sort of stuff? Well, I certainly don't engage with stuff like Deleuze and Lacan. Again, I don't really know them. Um, but I, I would say, you know, look, a lot, of, um, a lot of analytic philosophy, a lot of the, I mean, I guess you're saying that, so you say the structures of classical philosophy. Well, I mean, classical philosophy, if you, if you look at philosophy, you know, way back in the ancient Greeks, I mean, they were very much concerned with action, with living a good life, right? Like that was central to their concerns. So, okay, we come a bit more contemporary and look at analytic philosophy, the sort of philosophy I do. Yeah, it's true. 
I mean, a lot of it is kind of abstract. A lot of it isn't particularly practical. And I actually like that. That's the kind of philosophy that I'm the most interested in. Um, I am a militantly anti-pragmatist. Um, I don't think that philosophy has to serve any particular practical function. I don't think it has to, you know, teach us how to live. I don't think it has to help us solve problems. It doesn't have to do that, but it can do. And you know what? Um, there's plenty of analytic philosophy that is concerned with that. You know, there's um, uh, philosophy, well, in ethics, in political theory, in philosophy of science. Uh, you can find plenty of philosophers who are aiming to solve practical problems. Um, again, it's not so much the sort of thing that I'm doing. Uh, so, but I, I do engage with it, I, I, you know, a little bit. Um, you, you will find that occasionally I upload videos on ethics and things like that, and occasionally political theory, stuff like that. So I do, I do think about it sometimes. Um, have you ever considered the impossible clear distinction between philosophy and poetry or between philosophy and any expressive art? Um, yeah, so this, I, I mean, I'm not sure entirely what you're getting at here, but... Um, one of the things that interests me is that um, it's very common in philosophy for there to be a kind of deferentialism to other traditions. So, I mean, these days we see that very much with the sciences, right? Like, and it's not surprising, given the incredible progress that science has shown and given how it has had such an enormous impact on our lives and produced all of this technology, right? Like science is the big dog these days. And there are a lot of philosophers who think that philosophy should be kind of deferential to science. Um, and that's going to involve, I mean, there's, there's different ways that that can manifest itself. So there's a kind of deference in terms of content where there's this assumption that like, well, philosophers should not propose theories that contradict the, the established theories of science. So we should like let the content of our scientific theories guide our philosophical theorizing. Um, and then there's deference with respect to methodology. So, you know, many philosophers will kind of have this methodological naturalist view where they say that uh, philosophy is continuous with the sciences. There isn't really a strict distinction, or perhaps there shouldn't really be a strict distinction between the methods used in philosophy and the methods of the sciences. Um, so there's like, like deference in terms of content, deference in terms of methodology. Maybe there are other types of deference as well. Um, so we have very commonly we see deference to science. In the past, um, you had deference to religion. I mean, that, like, a great deal of philosophy in the past was, like, constrained by the religious institutions. It was expected to defer. Um, I think also quite common is um, deference to, like, intuition or common sense. Um, so, you know, you see that in people like G.E. Moore and the more contemporary Morians, you see that in Michael Human's phenomenal conservatism, uh, very common for philosophers to appeal to common sense. Um, now, one of the things that I have sort of been playing around with in my mind is, you know, these different, these different kinds of deference result in different kinds of philosophy. And I do sometimes wonder, what would it look like if philosophers had a deference to art? Like, what would that be? Like, I kind of know what deference to science is, what deference to religion is, what deference to common sense is. What is deference to art? Now, maybe this doesn't really make sense because, I mean, you might say, well, the, the thing is with art is that art is not cognitive. It's not epistemic. It doesn't forward any particular propositions. It, it doesn't have any particular methods of inquiry. So it... it it's, it's possible to defer to science because science gives us a world view and you can defer to that world view. But like art doesn't have a world view. Art doesn't make any claims, doesn't have any methods of inquiry. So you can't, it just doesn't even make sense to talk about deferring to it. But I don't know about that. I, I think that that, that that view of art might itself be a product of the, uh, the sort of scientism of our age. Um, it's actually quite common, I think, for, uh, for, for artists to think of themselves as, like, getting at the truth in some sense. You know, there, there is a, a kind of artistic truth. There is a, a truth in a lot of artworks or, like, artworks... Well, yeah, I mean, I think m many artists would say, no, like, this, 
this really is cognitive in the sense that it's this artwork is making claims about things and those claims are indeed you know revealing things about you know life about humanity about the world um that maybe couldn't even be revealed by the sciences like maybe we are um you know this is a, 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 an alternative way of knowing um so okay like with with that with that all said then what would um what would deference to art look like and i am not sure i haven't really thought about it in uh, in enough detail to have any clear answer um so you know there's there's not a lot i can say about this but i think it's an interesting thing that i you know I, well I, I might think about it a bit more but yeah um i have considered this question of like well yeah the dis okay the distinction between philosophy and art um i mean there's a pretty clear intuitive distinction but you know even given that distinction maybe like what would it look like for philosophy to adopt more of the methods of art or for philosophy to defer to art rather than these other traditions? Interesting question, I think. I will leave that open for now. Uh, Tobias Yoda asks, veganism, veganism, question um, mark. I've answered the question on veganism previously, so um, that might be in the previous video, but uh, I'll, I'll put a little note in the description saying where I've answered that one. Um, Tom Duron, do you think the more decentralized or anarchistic a society is, the less likely it is to pollute and contribute to climate change? Or would more sustainable and self-sufficient societies naturally lead to egalitarianism due to the material conditions that would entail? I have no idea. Um, um, so I, I can't say. I've never looked into it. Um, I don't know anything about... I think that in order to have an informed opinion about this, you would need to know a hell of a lot about economics you need to know a lot about, you know, different social structures and so on. And then you'd need to be willing to take a bit of a risk, uh, you know, like a risk extrapolating that into the future and what that might look like in the future. I have no basis for doing that. So um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, prima facie, I don't see any particular relation between, um, you know, like climate change and egalitarianism. It seems entirely it seems to me entirely possible that you could have a you know brutally authoritarian and hierarchical society um that is just nevertheless really pro environment and um and like maybe like maybe that's actually the way it becomes really pro environment i mean you know look at the khmer rouge right like they probably uh they, that 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 probably promoted environmental health uh but <laughs> like i i i have no idea um Okay. Okay. Um, top lad, what is your position regarding the analytic synthetic distinction? Um, I would say I reject it. Uh, pretty much. I pretty much reject it because I think that meaning and reference is indeterminate. So an analytic statement is supposed to be a statement that is true in virtue of the meaning of the terms, but I don't think there's really going to be any truth just in virtue of the meaning of the terms because there's no fact of the matter what exactly the meaning of the terms is <laughs> uh so uh, for that reason yeah i mean you're not going to get um an analytic synthetic distinction i mean it's basically the same reason that quine rejected the analytic synthetic distinction although my reasons for favoring a sort of indeterminacy of, re of meaning are not quite the same as quine's reasons for favoring an indeterminacy of meaning um but yeah, I mean, we come to the same place in that respect. I would say, I mean, look, I, I say like I pretty much reject it because I think that what you can do is you can just stipulate, right? I can make a stipulation. So I can stipulate that, okay, I'm going to use bachelor to mean the same as unmarried man. But I think that you have to be a bit careful with stipulation because I think that, um, you know, some people will treat stipulation as though what you're really doing is actually expressing the meanings of these terms. Whereas I think what's really going on is that a stipulation is going to hold only within some very particular sort of context. Um, and it it's really more like it's not that you're sort of expressing some meaning that was there. Rather, you're just making a commitment to use terms in a certain way. So I take it that when you stipulate that bachelor means the same as unmarried man, you're basically just making a commitment to uh, 
the idea that um, you know you will be willing to substitute the word bachelor for the words unmarried man and vice versa in certain relevant sets of sentences. Probably not all sets of sentences because um, you know when it comes to uh, opaque contexts like you know Frank believes that such and such is a bachelor or you know Frank said that such and such then maybe you don't think that the substitutivity works there but in any case right the, the point is there's going to be what you can do is just stipulate in the sense that you can make a commitment to uh, uh, substituting one term for another within particular sets of sentences but that stipulation is going to be in a particular context for some purpose usually um, so like I mean the context where this will come up would be you know I might just stipulate that I'm using uh, certain philosophical terms in a certain way like I just say you know I'm using the term um, anarchism to mean the uh, the view that there is no justification for the existence of a state right now whether that connects to exactly how the term anarchism has been used in the anarchist tradition is just irrelevant because I'm just stipulating right you can stipulate that's fine um, but that is as far as um, as far as it goes when it comes to uh, uh, yeah the the analytic synthetic distinction I think that's that's as far as it goes when it comes to truth in virtue of meaning um, okay Tristan Youngberg What's your favourite film that uses philosophy thematically to explore concepts or discusses it in some way or another? I don't like films that, d that do that. Um, or rather, I should say that I don't think there are any films that are any good at uh, discussing philosophy or exploring philosophy. And the, re the reason is very simple. When I do philosophy, what I like, ultimately, are the arguments. I like things to be set out very neatly and there to be, you know arguments for and against each position and it's just really hard to do that in films there are films i like which you know have more philosophical themes um but i'm usually not so into like that that can be like maybe a nice bonus it's kind of cool when you sort of notice a certain philosophical theme in a movie but the truth is i don't think i would ever go to a, a film in order to like <laughs> learn the philosophy um so yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure there are any really that um, that meet that. I, I would say that probably this isn't a film, but the best example that I've seen of an attempt to I actually explore certain philosophical issues is Star Trek: The Next Generation, and maybe uh, no, I think Star Trek. I was going to say maybe Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. But as much as I love Deep Space Nine, I'm well. I guess there are. So it does still raise some philosophical issues. But The Next Generation is is really good at that. I think um, there are a lot of episodes in The Next Generation where it it will raise a kind of philosophical problem, and then it will kind of give a voice to alternative takes on the problem uh, where it, it sort of it takes those alternative views seriously um, and sometimes it can be quite surprising because like there's there's one episode for instance where they're talking about like the moral justification of terrorism and they like act they give the terrorists like good arguments I mean it's not just like you, you kind of don't expect that in that sort of show right like it's the sort of show where you'd expect there to just be a kind of no there's a clear good and evil here like of course terrorism is not justified, but no, they actually uh, they actually give the terrorists um, a, a case and they take it seriously. Um, so again, that's not a film, but I think if you want to watch something that explores philosophy, probably the best bet is Star Trek: The Next Generation. But the truth is, if you really want to learn about the sorts of philosophical issues that are raised in those Next Generation episodes, you should just read philosophy. Um, the next generation is wonderful, but it's not wonderful in virtue of the philosophy. Um, okay, then. Tashu asks, is there a philosophy of suicide? Can a suicidal person reason their way out of their situation? There is a philosophy of suicide. Yes, there is plenty of literature on that. It's not a literature I know that well, but uh, it's out there. <laughs> um, as for whether a suicidal person can reason their way out, I would have thought probably not. I mean... I mean, I, I guess, like, okay, 
Well, there's going to be two cases, right? So there are, there are potentially cases where somebody is going to commit suicide on the basis of, like, actually reasoning through, um, you know, their values, their goals, the likelihood of them being able to meet their goals and so on, and then just coming to the conclusion that their life is not worth it. But in most cases, I would have thought that that's not what's going on. Um, in most cases, it seems to me, uh, suicide is going to follow, it, it, like the, the, the suicidal inclinations are going to be a product of just, you know, something like depression um, or, you know, some other kind of uh, mental abnormality where it's it's not so much that somebody's like actually sitting down and reasoning about things. It's just, you know, they have, well, a, a, a kind of drive or a feeling or in the case of depression, maybe it's just a complete absence of feelings. But, you know, there's like a failure to connect with the world in the normal sorts of ways and that's just what's driving them to the to suicide um but i mean now if, if that's the case right okay you're not going to reason that sort of person out of the situation are you um so but then i'm thinking well i mean that's probably not not the case for everybody um I, I, like i guess <laughs> I guess there probably are cases where somebody can reason their way to suicide. That that almost certainly happens. I mean, I'm just thinking about my own my own like situation here, where it, I have expressed very pessimistic sentiments um, in many videos. Um, you know, so I have said that, like, actually, you know, when I think about what sorts of values I have, what my goals are, it really does seem like my life is just not worth living. Um, it's it's not been worth living up to this point, and it's probably going to get worse in the future. Okay, so with that said, you might say, well, why not just commit suicide, <laughs> right? Like, shouldn't you just commit suicide then? Um, and I mean, this is a question that um, uh, is raised for people who are pessimists in general, for people who are antinatalists. It's a, it's a problem um, that's raised against antinatalism. So this is one case of where there is a philosophy of suicide, because... The arguments for antinatalism, the arguments to the effect that you ought not to bring people into existence, um, argue, arguably, right, the objection is made that this is also going to entail that you ought not to continue to exist, that actually you should just end your existence. Um, now, uh, okay, regardless of whether or not that's those arguments are compelling, the fact of the matter is, I have never been even remotely tempted to commit suicide. Uh, and I can't really, it's, it's difficult to kind of even get my head into a space where it's like, where I would be remotely tempted to do that, even though um, I'm like evaluating my life as, as, as not even being worth living. It's just, that's just like this kind of intellectual conclusion. It doesn't have any uh, motivational force on my behavior. Um, and I, I can't help but think that for, you know, like a normal a kind of average adult human being, that's probably also the case. Ultimately, regardless of how, you know, regardless of what conclusions you're reasoning to, I mean, you know, you're, you're coming up against, like, billions of years of evolution, right? <laughs> uh, it's hard to overcome that. Um, I suppose it's entirely possible that somebody could reason their way to this kind of conclusion and maybe that would motivate them and then maybe you could present them with reasons that would uh, get them to change their minds you know you, you could maybe convince them that actually life will get better um that seems entirely possible to me but i'm just i, I don't think that i think that generally speaking um you know what what's going to motivate a person to commit suicide is probably not going to be responsive to reasoning um but then maybe you know maybe that's just the case for like our beliefs in general i mean it uh it can be very difficult to reason people out of certain positions in general can't it um tick 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 i don't know how that name's pronounced tick 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 um, how can the existence of abstract objects like numbers be compatible with physicalism? What does it even mean for abstract objects to exist? Um, so, 
I think that one of the reasons why um, you saw this shift from talk of materialism to talk of physicalism um, is because the sorts of entities that were being postulated by our best sciences turned out not to be material. They turned out to be these like weird occult things, um, like forces and fields. And then there's all that weird quantum phenomena, right? Um, so, you know, there, there is this kind of tradition. And I think that, you know, we can kind of call it broadly like the materialist tradition, the physicalist tradition. It's the same tradition, right? But the tradition involves a kind of attitude of deference to the content of our best scientific theories, right? Like the attitude is that um, our best scientific theories tell us the way the world is. And, you know, that should guide our metaphysics, right? They are, uh, at least in principle, giving us a complete picture. Um, so, like, if you want to know what is in the world, right, you just look to science. And I think that is probably what's motivating most of the people who call themselves materialists or physicalists, okay? Now, with that said... Um, well, you can fairly straightforwardly get to the existence of abstract objects because scientific theories seem to quantify over abstract objects. I mean, you know, there is the, uh, what does the saying go, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in physics. Um, scientific theories are thoroughly mathematized. Um, so we're constantly re referring to mathematical objects, which are presumably abstract. Um, I mean, there is an issue here, right? Like, the question is going to be, well, what exactly is a physical property? And many of the initial, like, the sort of initial answers we might give to that question are going to rule out abstract objects. So we might say that a physical property is a property that exists in space and time, while abstract objects don't exist in space and time. Or maybe a physical property is a property with causal powers, um, but abstract objects don't have causal powers. So that's the prima facie tension, I suppose. I, I mean, one of, I, so I think that a general problem here is that it's not entirely clear what physicalism is. So when you're asking like, well, how can the existence of these things be compatible with this metaphysical view? Well, first of all, we need to give an account of what exactly that metaphysical view is. What exactly is a physical property? Now, if you say that physical properties are just those properties that are postulated by our best scientific theories, then there's no issue with the existence of abstract objects because abstract objects are... So, like, mathematical objects seem to be fairly directly postulated within our best scientific theories and models. Um, if you say that physical properties are properties that exist in space and time or properties with causal powers, well, then you're going to run up against the problem that actually um, it's not at all clear that, you know, if you take, if you take modern physics, it's not at all clear that, um, you know, space and time are fundamental or that causal powers or that there really are causal powers. That's actually an open debate, right? So um, I suppose this is, this is just one thing to bear in mind, right? Like physicalism is not this fixed thing. Um, and it's not entirely clear what the commitments of physicalism are. And so with that in mind, maybe there isn't, maybe we shouldn't expect that there's going to be such an issue with abstract objects. I mean, I would wonder, so I guess the way I would, I would my question to you would be, what do you take the tension between the postulation of abstract objects and physicalism to be like where do you what what's the problem that you see there um and i suppose that might tell you something about how you're conceiving of what physicalism is um but ultimately look um you could well be a physicalist who sees this tension between physicalism and abstract objects and then just says okay there's no abstract objects I mean, maybe the existence of abstract objects is not compatible with physicalism. And so physicalists are committed to just denying abstract objects. And then in that case, they would need to give some anti-realist account of, you know, mathematics and, you know, other, uh, other fields that postulate abstract objects. Um, you know, mathematical fictionalism, some, some forms of mathematical structuralism, for instance. There are lots of options. Um, so that's, I, I guess, the answer to that. Um, unstable PC. 
What is the thing you irrationally hate that most others might love? That is a difficult question. Um, because there's not a lot of things that I really hate. I'm actually quite sort of, you know, just kind of calm and easygoing. I mean, I, I don't really get mad about stuff. Um, what do I irrationally hate? Um, well, I can't think of anything. I can't think of anything. So what do I do here? Do I just sit here and try to think of something? It could take quite a while. What do I, I mean, I'm not sure. What, what is it that, what things do I irrationally hate? I mean, never mind. What's the thing that I irrationally hate that most others might love? What do I irrationally hate? What, what do I even hate? I mean, I do hate other people, um, generally speaking. Um, that's one thing that I hate that other people might enjoy. Um, I do hate, like, sports as well. Uh, football, rugby, particularly those competitive sports. Um, maybe that is the answer to that question. Yeah, that's a good answer, isn't it? It, it would be. It would be sports. I, 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 I cannot stand. I can't. I can't stand them. I, I, sports is. It's utterly mystifying to me what people get out of that. So I guess. I guess that's the answer. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, there we go. Finally got there. Got there in the end. Um, v. Tomazzoni, uh, do you see psychoanalysis as a science? Um, well. Not really, but I don't see that as being a particularly substantive question, really, um, because I don't think that there's a strict distinction between science and non-science. That's the first thing. And I also think that the, the interesting question isn't really about whether or not something is a science, but it's going to be about, well, you know, is it, is it like good science? Um, so there are things that might count as science, but that are, you know, a waste of time or that are, you know, or, or that face like very serious methodological problems. I mean, you know, you can find certain fields of science where, you know, there are there are problems with respect to things like, uh, you know, financial incentives potentially distorting and biasing the field where, um, I mean, if you look at things like, for instance, pharmaceutical uh, science, uh, medical science with respect to pharmaceutical drugs, lots and lots of problems there. Um, you know, Jacob Stegenga has a nice book called Medical Nihilism that talks about this um, in detail. I mean, I'm quite happy to say that this is a science, right? That that what what's going on here when we study pharmaceutical drugs, when we try to find uh, effective pharmaceutical treatments, I'm happy to call that medical science. Um, but is it good science? like it that it there are so many serious problems um with that field uh so you, you know f for example um like you have problems to do with the fact that um the the sorts of uh measures that are used to determine the whether or not a drug has been effective at curing a particular problem um are are just not actually measuring what they should be measuring, right? So, um, for instance, uh, the case of drugs to treat depression, um, there's a scale that's used uh, to measure depression, and it lists, it has like a list of 20 questions or something, and then you give yourself a score out of five or something like that for each question. Um, and then whether or not you have depression is going to be a matter of uh, whether or not you have a score over a certain amount. Anyway, um, when you do trials of drugs to treat depression, this scale is often used. Um, but the problem is, is that it's considered to be a, a significant if a person, if, if the drug sort of 
reduces it by 10 points. I'm making up these numbers if it's not clear. Okay, to be clear, I'm making up all of these numbers. This is an example. It's supposed to be illustrative, but uh, it, the, the drug will be considered effective if it reduces the depression score by 10 points on average, right? But the problem is, is that there are lots of questions there, like, um, you know, uh, a question might be something like, um, I very often feel irritable or I, I, I very often cannot concentrate or something like that. And it basically, it turns out that a drug that has a mere soporific effect, a drug that just makes people sleepy, would reduce the depression score by like 15 points. Um, so that would count as like a clinically significant intervention in depression. Um, so this is one problem, okay? Um, and then there are like a ton of other problems as well. So we have a science, but is it a good science? Is it producing trustworthy results? Mm, maybe not. Um, on the other hand, there's lots of things that aren't science, but that are well worth doing, uh, I think. Um, so the, the question, I, I think the thing is, is when we ask something like, well, is psychoanalysis a science? Um, the, one of the things we're presupposing there is that like science is epistemically good. Like science is, if, if something counts as a science, then that means it's like worthwhile. Um, whereas again, the assumption would be, well, if it's not a science, then it's not worthwhile. Now, certainly, um, if we're looking at area at like sort of fields of inquiry that present themselves as sciences then it's relevant whether or not it actually is a science right like I, I can see why that would be a relevant question but I'm not sure if that's the case for psychoanalysis um I I don't really know much about modern psychoanalysis I mean I know yeah okay it comes from Freud Freud considered himself a psychologist but you know we've had over a hundred years since then um a lot of what happens in psychoanalysis, I mean, it's a kind of therapy, there's things like dream interpretation and stuff like that. I mean, it doesn't really, again, I don't know much about this, but it doesn't feel like the sort of thing that's going to be based on very robust empirical evidence. Um, but that doesn't mean that it is, um, that it's not worthwhile, that it's not um, something that might be illuminating and interesting and yeah, I mean, yeah, I, you know, there's, there's lots of things in the world that are uh, good beyond science. And even if something is a science, that doesn't necessarily mean it's good. So that's my answer to that question. Uh, video essay guy, is it possible to be a true nonconformist or is everyone just choosing what culture to conform to? Does conforming to a small subculture or counterculture make you any more of a nonconformist than conforming to mainstream culture? Um, I don't know. I feel like this is just a matter of how you want to use the word conformist. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this seems this seems like a matter of stipulation to me. Um, so, like, we can talk about the counterculture, but then, oh, hang on a minute. Isn't the counterculture itself a kind of culture? Well, yeah, of course it was. Um, of course, I, um, I win this one because, uh, you know, I'm... Um, I'm a, an extremely introverted and frankly somewhat curmudgeonly um, loner and therefore I'm not conforming to mainstream culture or subcultures or countercultures or any other kind of culture. Um, except of course I am because uh, I just can't get away from humanity. I just can't cut it out. Um, it's a problem. You know, there is part of me that I, I would like to just disappear and go and live in a cabin in the woods. But the thing is, I like my creature comforts um, and I like having the Internet. I like having a computer. I like being able to sit on a sofa. I wish I could have all of this stuff without having to deal with people. Um, that would be really nice. I mean, that's one reason why I would like to get into Nozick's experience machine. I could just cut out all of the people and get all of the stuff I want. Uh, without having to deal with any of them. It'd be wonderful. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I guess, um, anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. As to your question, I think this is really just going to be, um, I, I don't know, this seems like a verbal question uh, about how we, how we want to use the word conformist. Um, okay, so Vijay Malaya asks um, a rather long question here. Um, 
about, uh, do I read all of this out? I mean, you say, in short, what is the solution to solipsism? Um, and my answer to that is I, I don't actually think there is a solution to it. It seems to me that there's no grounds at all for ruling out, uh, for ruling out solipsism. Um, that's pretty much my answer. Um, and I mean, the same is going to be the case for many other skeptical scenarios as well. Um, so solipsism is, is one skeptical scenario among many that it seems to me is totally plausible. And there's n nothing really to be said against it. I mean, maybe it's kind of impractical. Maybe it's, uh, you know, if solipsism were true, I would feel a loss in certain ways, perhaps. Um, but hey, I mean, there's no reason why the world has to conform to my desires. Um, so I don't think there really is a solution. Uh, I've always been very unimpressed by um, the responses to these sorts of sceptical problems. Um, VL Now, did you film this in front of a bookcase because what you like a lot more than materialistic things is knowledge? No, the reason why it's filmed in front of a bookcase is because my room is uh, is such, it's laid out such that the only place I can really sit is that particular place. And so it, the bookcase just happens to be behind me, but I'm not actually intentionally setting it up to show off my books. I I don't really think that there's anything more valuable about knowledge than about materialistic things. So, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I, I disagree with John Stuart Mill, you know. Mill says that there's this distinction between the higher and lower pleasures. I don't think there is. Um, I don't think there's anything more special about pursuing knowledge or just, you know, pursuing the latest big TV and fast car. It so happens that I have basically no interest in the big TV and the fast car, and I do have an interest in uh, philosophy. Um, but yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with people who just have different desires there. Um, so I, I, I'm, as, and as for why you see the bookcase again, that's just um, a, a fluke of how my room is set up. Uh, Vrayley asks, why do you re refuse to sort out that Barnet? I didn't know what a Barnet was, so I looked it up online. Apparently Barnet is a haircut. Obviously it's because I am lazy. I don't care about how I look. Uh, that's... That's the answer. I just don't care at all. Um, you also ask, if you had to write fiction, what type of book would you write? Very hard to answer that because I don't read fiction. Um, <laughs> I don't really, I, so I really have no feelings about it at all. Um, I don't know what book I would, what type of book I, I would write if I had to write fiction. I don't know what I would be good at. I don't feel like I'd be good at really writing any kind of fiction. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, if I had to, though, you're asking me if I had to, right? If I had to do it, gun to the head, you have to write some fiction. It would be, um, I would choose something in the moment. I, I, I would get a feeling in the moment and just go with that. Like right now, in this moment i'm kind of having the feeling of maybe i'd like do some sort of I'd, I'd want maybe some sort of science fiction i'd want it to be the case that there's like a lot of absence a lot of kind of nothing happening um i'd want it to be like ambiguous to kind of have an ambiguous ending um and and to be kind of ambiguous all the way through but but where like there's yeah there's there's sort of it's it's barren it's desolate there's not much going on um it doesn't have a linear plot um there's very little content and very little form right there's no i would want to write it in such a way that it's there, there's there's not like there's no interesting dialogue there's no interesting characters there's nobody that you can connect with i would want to try to create something that is aiming for for boredom as an aesthetic it's really hard to do that but there are some artworks 
that like successfully uh, they like make kind of boredom and dullness into the aesthetic goal and that can be very intriguing um, so I would I would want to give that a shot I'd, I'd do that because honestly I don't think I'd be good at anything else I mean I don't think I'd be good at writing engaging characters or witty dialogue or uh, or anything like that so uh, maybe I would maybe I would give boredom a go um, why? What's your favourite book or piece of writing? I feel like you have a good taste in literature. Um, I, I don't. I don't have any taste in literature because I don't read it. I, uh, I don't have enough time to read it. That's, this, that's the reason why um, I spend... If I'm reading something, I'm going to be reading philosophy. Um, that's what I do most of the time. And then in my free time, I don't want to read because I spend all my... Like when I'm working, I'm reading. And so in my free time, I don't want to have to read. Uh, I want to do something else. So I... I don't have a good taste in literature. Um, my favourite book, though, I mean, uh, non-fiction, would be... Uh, it would be it probably uh, Feyerabend's Against Method, um, or maybe Hume's Treatise. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I like that a lot as well. Um, I, no, I think I'll go with, with Feyerabend's Against Method. Um, William W. Bybans, do you recall your discussion with the YouTuber R... Arvol on metaethics. If so, what were your thoughts on the conversation? Um, yeah, I recall it. I felt that I, 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 there was a real difficulty kind of connecting and seeing things from the point of view he was coming from. And um, I, I, I'm very much on the fence about the value of doing conversations in general. Um, I feel like they haven't been very successful overall when I've had discussions with people. Um, sometimes it goes okay, but sometimes it's just kind of disastrous. That felt like one of the disastrous ones where I, I don't feel like I gave a very good performance and I don't feel like I said anything particularly interesting. And I don't, I, I, I really struggled to, um, to, to just get the perspective that was being presented to me. Um, so, yeah, it, it, unfortunately, uh, I didn't get much out of it. And I can't imagine that any of the viewers did either. Um, Yasin CCH, what's your thoughts on primitive concepts? Do you think there are such? I mean, it depends on what a primitive concept is supposed to be. But um, no, I mean, I would be inclined to think that there aren't. So the way that I would usually think of primitive concepts is that a primitive concept is like some sort of foundational concept from maybe from which other concepts are derived or defined and then that foundational concept is just it, you know that foundational concept like cannot be defined or kind of cannot be further understood in any other way it can't be broken down um i i very much doubt that this is the case i think that um so i i would i would my guess would be that concepts are going to be First of all, they're going to have more like a, a kind of web-like structure, right? I don't think that you have these sort of foundational concepts from which other concepts are derived. I think, in, I think what really happens is, you know, as you start to kind of like learn a language, um, you know, you, you, you get like a few kind of nodes in the web and then connections get drawn between the different nodes and then it just gets uh, more and more and more sophisticated. Um, and there's no, you know, obviously some concepts are learned earlier, right? Like the concept of, I, I don't know, mum, <laughs> mother, <laughs> yeah. Um, but then even mother, I mean, mother isn't really the concept that's, it's, but that's probably not, it's not like babies have the concept of mother when they go, mama. Um, there's, there's some much more kind of vague, much more imprecise thing going on in their minds. Um, there's like some categorization that has some relation to this idea of mother, but of course it's not mother as our concept is. So, you know, you get these kind of vague, imprecise concepts and then you just get, well, more and more and they form this big interconnected web where um, for many of these concepts, there are then going to be um, connections to one's immediate experience. Um, like, I think that many of what we might think of as foundational concepts, um, they're kind of nodes in the web that are very close to uh, 
<laughs> close to I don't know what that metaphor is but you know yeah the, the point is there are some there are going to be like some nodes in this web where they're just like connected quite closely to experience where you know like I mean color concepts for instance I, I use the concept red if you ask me what red is it's very difficult to define it but I can kind of point to lots of things in the world if you ask me what causality is well cause is a lot more tricky um because in the case of causality, well, again, I can kind of point to things in the world. I can point to events in the world. I can sort of say, you know, I, OK, look at this billiard ball rolling and then hits another billiard ball, rolls away. I'm like, ah, that that bit, that bit where you have the one ball connects to another and the other one goes away. That's causality. Or I can say, ah, when you put your hand in the fire and then you burn the hand, that fire burning, that's causality, you know. Um, so... I can I can sort of point to things, but in that case, um, nothing that I'm pointing to is going to capture um, all of the concept. I mean, certainly, uh, merely pointing to a series of events doesn't give you the uh, the causal glue, the necessary connection. Um, so, okay, we have some concepts that are learned earlier. We have some concepts that are sort of closer to our immediate experiences than other concepts. And then they just kind of form this big web. That's my guess. I mean, what I'm saying there is, uh, is it's not really based on any psychological evidence. So um, take it with a grain of salt. But I'm, I'm skeptical of the idea of primitive concepts. I think that where it, where, it, where it makes sense to talk about primitive concepts is in very specific contexts where we're like, you know, if you're doing, say, mathematics, then you can just stipulate some axioms. Or you just sort of you, you can say okay I'm taking the concept of point as primitive right like there's no further definition but obviously what we're doing there is we're we're introducing a new concept a technical concept that's introduced by stipulation when we talk about point as a mathematical concept that's not just the same as our everyday colloquial concept of point it's like a it's it's going to be a kind of precisification of it and in saying that point is primitive, it's only primitive with respect to some technical process of mathematical definition. It's not going to be primitive with respect to our webs of belief, because, of course, mathematical points, right? Well, we actually can talk about what that is, and it does relate to our other concepts in all sorts of ways. Um, you know, I mean, that's so here's the thing. A mathematical point is maybe not exactly the same as a colloquial point, but they're pretty closely related. Right. So, I mean, the mathematical point is primitive in a it's a technical concept that's primitive in a technical sense. Um, and that, I think, is the only sense that there is to be made of primitive concepts. Um, UTUB, U, UTUB club, uh, cub rather. Um, asks if I've ever read any Hegel or Foucault's lectures in book form. Um, I have read part of one of Foucault's books. I think it was uh, the history of sexuality. Um, but and and you know what? It wasn't that obscure. Um, it was it was as far as I recall, um, pretty easy to follow. Um, I mean, I like you know the the. I'm not sure. I can't really comment much on it. I don't remember much about it now. Um, but I remember finding it. Uh, you know reasonably easy to follow but you say um that uh, their lectures are some of the most clear and precise either thinker gets just wondered if you ever engaged with these texts if so what you thought of them yeah so okay i, I don't know about the the hegel um but yeah foucault i i agree yeah it seemed seemed pretty clear i mean i would also say that um i i, I think that part of what's motivating the judgment that that these people are unclear is is just our kind of educational background here like if you are some people <laughs> seem to have a more they seem to be more inclined towards the sorts of ways that analytic philosophers think about things and talk about things and then of course if you are then trained in analytic philosophy that's going to hone those skills but i can imagine you know if you're coming from uh, a very different sort of background you might find analytic philosophy somewhat impenetrable and confusing where whereas you know someone like Foucault just seems to gel with how you think um maybe I don't know um but yeah I I uh I agree that Foucault's book 
was not unclear, um, at least the one I read. Um, Zeb PC says, when theists try to ground moral realism in God's nature, what do you make of that? They say Euthyphro is a false dilemma. It's not God recognizing the moral facts independent of him. And the moral facts aren't what God, God likes, but the moral facts are what is in line with God's nature. And this supposedly makes them evade anti-realism. Yeah, the God's nature thing is, um, it's, it's, it's a poor response to me. I, 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 the problem is this. As soon as you say that the moral facts are what follows from God's nature, well, you can just restate the euthyphro in terms of God's nature, right? Does God have the ability to change his nature or not? Um, if God does not have the ability to change his nature, then, well, it, it, now it looks like the moral facts are going to be independent of God. Um, you know, like God's nature is just what it is. It's something that he has no control over. Um, so, you know, in, in the same way, it's kind of like there are certain things about me that just follow from my nature. Um, and that, you know, I might not like that. Right. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not able to fly, for instance. Right. Like I have a certain biological body that co that comes with certain limitations. So I can't just get up. I can't spread my wings and fly. Um, OK, but then. That's something that's like independent of my will. It's something that's independent of my mind. It's something that like, you know, I might, I, like, I can't control it. It's so similarly with God, right? If you just say, well, it's just in line with his nature. If his nature is then postulated as being, you know, this, this sort of set of characteristics or properties um, that are just kind of fixed necessarily, then it starts to feel like... Um, you, you're you're accepting the horn of the euthyphro where the moral facts are actually independent of God um, in the relevant sense of independent of. Um, on the other hand, if God can change his nature, well, you know, then he can change his nature. He can change the moral facts. Um, so I don't to me, that doesn't seem to to get out of the uh, of the euthyphro dilemma. Um, OK, so, yeah. I'm, I'm, I don't, and I think more broadly, I mean, just saying that the moral facts are in line with God's nature, it just doesn't, um, it's not satisfying in the sense that it's like, okay, but how does that, how does that get us moral facts? I mean, one thing I will say for a kind of, let, let's just say divine command theory, right? Like, and, and a kind of naive divine command theory, which just says, no, God does decide what the moral facts are. God makes judgments, right? And yeah, I mean, if God had said that slavery was acceptable, then slavery would be acceptable. But he didn't, right? God has made the judgment that slavery is not acceptable, so slavery is not acceptable, right? Take take the divine command theorist who takes the horn of the euthyphro that says God can just decide what the moral facts are. I think there's something like explanatorily satisfying about that. I mean, it, like, it, 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 I, I at least get like, okay, well, God is this entity that has created the universe that is incredibly powerful, right? He is a kind of authority, right? I mean, he just, just as a matter of fact, he does in fact have authority, right? Like he decides how things go. And so, and he can, you know, choose to uh, reward or punish us, right? So he is an authority who can enact that authority, right? And then this authority figure is laying down a rule, right? He's saying slavery is wrong. You ought not to enslave people. Well, I, I mean, yeah, that, that makes sense, right? This is a mind um, and the mind is laying down a rule. It's just like how, you know, certain people will lay down rules or certain institutions will lay down rules. It's just that God is greater than, bigger than all of them. Um, now, I mean, whether that's, you know, uh, a satisfying account of, like, does that save all of our intuitions about morality? No, maybe not. But I'm just saying, like, you know, if you're postulating that there are these kind of object, like mind independent. So if you're, if you're postulating that there are moral rules that are independent of our desires, independent of our minds, and that have some sort of authority over us saying that those moral rules are just what god has decided that actually makes sense um whereas i can't like 
saying that it follows from God's nature is just kind of weird. Like, okay, so what if the moral rule follows from God's nature, but then God says that that's not what he wants? Like, so it follows from God's nature that slavery is wrong, but God says slavery is acceptable. Like, that's the decision he comes to. So, now, of course, I mean, I assume a theist would say, ah, well, that's not possible, right? Like, God's decisions must be in line with God's nature. Yeah, whatever. I mean, it it's still... The, the puzzle, I feel, remains. Like, why is God's nature what matters? Um, how does that get us the moral facts? So, yeah, it's not satisfying. Um, you ask, if if your viewers had to watch one of your videos, what's the most important one to absorb and fully understand? Um, I don't have any opinion about that. Uh, yeah, I... You know, it's up to you. just depends on what your interests are. Um, I don't really... I don't think any of my videos are really like important in some in some kind of general sense, right? Like if you're interested in philosophy, you're going to get something out of my videos, hopefully. Um, but if not, uh, fine. <laughs> and and people who are interested in philosophy are interested in different things. I don't think there's any particular video I've done that like needs to be viewed by every philosopher or anything like that. Um. Zeus Kolbach, what is your approach to normative problems as an error theorist? Well, you know, I'm not really sure I would adopt the label error theorist, but I'm happy to go with it. If you want to call me an error theorist, that's fine. Um, so I'll, I'll, I accept, um, <laughs> I accept. And then the question is, well, how do you approach normative problems? Um, and I think the answer is, is that, look, I'm not a moral abolitionist, um, I can't see any good reason to stop using moral discourse. Um, why, like, why should I? Why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I just carry on? Like, I, I, I enjoy calling some things right and other things wrong, calling some things good and other things bad. I enjoy using that language, so why the hell shouldn't I continue to do so? Um, and then when it comes to, you know, engaging in moral arguments with people, like, let's say somebody says that, abortion is impermissible, and I want to argue that abortion is permissible. Well, how do I approach that? Well, I mean, I think that the sorts of tools that I have available for uh, talking to that other person are going to be the same sorts of tools that are available to people who have other meta-ethical views. So, you know, I can try to argue that maybe there's some sort of inconsistency in the view that's held by the other person. And then the assumption, of course, is that uh, people do not want to have inconsistencies in their moral views. Um, so, like, I can try to show that, okay, well, given these other values that you accept, given these other norms that you accept, this actually entails that abortion is permissible. Um, so, you know, I, like, I can do that, right? You can make that sort of argument. That's a very common way of of arguing. Um, I mean, I can sort of, I can try to uh, sh appeal to shared values, right, to shared norms, shared principles. It so happens to be the case that most human beings have kind of similar interests, right? Um, they, they adopt similar values. I mean, people, at least people who are brought up in the same sort of culture tend to have similar emotional reactions to things. So, you know, I can appeal to shared values and try to use that to defend my position. Um, I can appeal to uh, their self-interest. I can appeal to pragmatic considerations like that. You know, I can kind of say, well, uh, uh, like, having this law in place is going to negatively affect you in some way. That can be a pretty uh, good way of getting people on board with you if you can get them to believe that. Um, and again, these sorts of strategies are just available to everybody. So that's what an error theorist can do. As long as, the, I mean, again, if you're a moral abolitionist, it's going to be a bit more difficult. A moral abolitionist is not going to be able to engage in moral practice because they think that that whole discourse, that whole practice should be eliminated. But most error theorists aren't saying that. What most error theorists say is just that... Um, Moral judgments express beliefs about objective moral properties, but there are no objective moral properties. Um, and then we might well add, so, mo so all moral judgments are false. Um, okay, but that doesn't stop you from 
engaging in moral discourse. Uh, you, you can still think that moral discourse is useful for various reasons. I mean, similarly, like, think about this, right? It's, uh, there are some philosophers who are eritheorists about colour. They say that uh, colour discourse presupposes that colours are objective properties of objects, but we know that there are no such objective properties that could play the, the role that colour plays. So there are no objective colour properties. So all colour judgments are false. C.L. Hardin has defended that kind of view. So what does that mean? I mean, does that mean that we just stop talking about colour and we, you know, stop engaging in, you know, like if I'm, for instance, an artist and I'm trying to you know, create a painting, um, I might sort of start thinking about, well, we better have this colour here, this colour here. I mean, there's still going to be, um, it's still going to be perfectly acceptable for us to talk about colour and to talk about things like colour mixing and what would be the appropriate colour to use in this context, etc. Um, so like if we're asking, you know, what's the best colour for, um, you know, street signs on the road or something like that? Well, you can engage in that kind of discourse uh, without thinking that the statements about colour are true. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, that's that's how you approach normative problems as an error theorist. You approach normative problems in basically the same way that everybody else approaches normative problems. Um, uh, I mean, error theory is a meta-ethical theory, right? What's happening when you accept mer when when you when you affirm error theory, you're kind of stepping back from the first order moral judgments, and then you're assessing the the whole discourse, the discourse as a whole, you're stepping back from it. But you can step back into it, you can stop doing philosophy and just kind of step back into it and go along with it if you want to. I mean, again, you could be a moral abolitionist, in which case um, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that. But, uh, okay. Um, Zoes Gigantom Megistus Minimus. Do modal anti-realists reject modal logic altogether and think it's useless and any other logic that's based on modal terms like possibility, probability, contingency, necessity. No, uh, you don't have to reject modal logic. Um, the idea of modal anti-realism is that there are no modal properties, there are no objective modal properties. Um, so you might take a kind of expressivist view where you say that, um, you know, our, our our judgments, our modal judgments are not really even expressing beliefs about the world, or maybe modal judgments do express beliefs about the world, but all those beliefs are false, you know, so you get the usual, you know, like expressivism, error theory, relativism, a modal anti-realist could adopt any of these sorts of positions with respect to modal claims. Um, now, I mean, modal logic is, I, I'm not really sure what it would be to reject modal logic altogether. I mean, modal logic is is just a formal system, right? It's it's a purely like abstract formal system. Um, you, you, you know, you have certain inference rules or you start with certain axioms and then, you know, you can derive things within the system and, you know, we can talk about the properties of that system. Um, so like, what would it be to reject that? I. I I don't, like, these sorts of logical systems have various different applications. So I think that modal logic might have, like, some applications within computer science. I could be wrong about that. But I've, I've heard that there are, you know, applications of modal logic, like, outside of philosophy. Um, so there's not, like, yeah, there's going to be no, no, a modal anti-realist is not going to have any objection to that. Now, what they might, what they would have an objection to is the idea that, modal logic is kind of revealing the objective structure of modal properties or is revealing the objective structure of the world or is, uh, uh, you know, they, they might also object to the idea that modal logic is kind of revealing how we ought to reason with modal claims. Um, but I mean, I think that, re so what's, what is key for, for the modal anti-realist would be Modal logic is not going to be, you know, revealing the sort of logical structure of modal properties because there are no modal properties. Um, it may well reveal the logical structure of our modal discourse. So modal logic might be perfectly appropriate as a kind of formalization of how we use modal discourse. Um, 
all that's all that you would need to say as a modal ANSI realist is okay this this logic is not going to be revealing facts about the modal properties that's all um so yeah there's no need to reject it altogether um you certainly don't have to think that it's useless um i mean obviously we frequently give arguments that involve modal claims and it may well be that the kind of formalizations that are afforded within modal logic can help to you know can help us w with respect to evaluating those arguments um and and it may well be that modal logic has many other applications beyond that as well uh zuel mayo asks how do you deal with normative beliefs as an error theorist well i've just answered that question look at my response to zeus kolbach uh that will be in the description um who are your favorite contemporary philosophers um uh, my favorite contemporary philosophers are uh i'm going to say that we're assuming these have to be living philosophers um in order to count as contemporary so my favorite living philosophers would be uh bas van frassen bas van frassen john norton um uh, John Dupre, maybe, although I'm not really so keen on some of his later work. I think I don't know if he counts because I really love Dupre's earlier work, but he's gotten into process philosophy more recently, which I just think is a, a dead end. Um, but, you know, he's still alive. So who else do I like? Um, oh, man, there's got to be somebody. I, I'm, I, my mind has kind of gone blank because I've been talking for so long. Uh, that, you know, how long has it been? You know, yeah, a little while. It's been been a long day, a long day for me. Um, and I'm just not thinking. Uh, and I don't have my bookshelf here. I'm in a different room. I haven't even got my bookshelf. I'd, I'd usually, like, look around and remind myself of uh, the philosophers. Let me see if I can... Um, there's got to be some other philosophers that I really like. Let me see. Who do I... Who do I like? <laughs> um... Uh, damn man nothing's coming to mind i'm just i'm just kind of like looking through uh my articles and books i'm like okay oh graham priest graham priest is another one yeah i really like graham priest um what is so we got now van frassen john norton graham priest um uh <laughs> uh this is bad i should have thought of this before um I should have planned something before uh, going into this question. Oh, all right. I can't be bothered with this. Um, you know what? If you're really interested in who my favorite philosophers are, ask me again in the comments and I'll go away. And when my mind is restored, um, I'll answer. Uh, but I can't think right now. Okay, that's the end of that.